going further. Just it's like in the US. Huh? The rich have become richer, the poor have become poorer. <laughs> That's the natural way, no? <laughs> that, 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 is economy. In India. that is the economy. Yeah, the the problem in Argentina problem is... My link, one minute. I'll have to get back the other uh, computer. The, the problem with the economy in Argentina is uh, a big amount of population is in the informal uh, work market. That means those who are selling in the streets, uh, they are working by themselves or whatever. So with the lockdown, and it was almost four months, it was extremely hard. Even though the government tried to support economically those who had a formal activity su supplying money for the informal, that was impossible. So those who are driving a taxi or they are painting homes or those who are uh, fixing uh, pipes uh, and uh, those who are driving dogs in the street. I mean, this kind of activity or personal trainers, for them, it was a nightmare. Yes, and it is travels and everything was affected everywhere. Here also, all those industries really got a bad hit at one time. But now with the recovery, I think everything is coming back gradually. The tourism is also returning and everything uh, is reasonably coming back now. Okay. So, okay. so he will join just a few minutes. There is some technical issue with him. And just, uh, I think it will sort out. Oh, no. uh, give me one second and come in. So, Vivek Ji, kaise ho? Vivek is around. Thik hai, sir, ek dam badi hai. Thik hai na? So, kaise chal raha hai? Aap ka abhi ta, same setup, aap ki economy improve hui, tere ko shift hoi wapis nahi abhi? Nahi, nahi. Wo kaite hai na, poorer became poorer keh raha tha ye. Pranav. Ha, mai bol raha tha. Pranav was saying poorer became poorer. Hamne bas wo hi dekhe hai, rich become richer to nahi dekh paaye. Poor become poorer dekh raha hai. सर वो एंटरप्राइजिंग लोग है ना जो हर सिचुएशन में फायदा उठा के आगे बढ़ते हैं ना वो गुजरात में सबसे ज्यादा देखने को मिलेंगे वो और कोविड में खूब पैसे कमाया लोगों ने बहुत बनाया बहुत बनाया सर हमारे यहाँ जितने अहमदाबाद में डॉक्टरों ने बीएमडब्ल्यू और पॉडी छुड़ाई है ना उतनी तो और मर्सिडीज उतनी तो पिछले दस साल में नहीं छुड़ाई थी Wherever they joined, I think, sir. Okay. Yes. Great. Oh, yes. Hello. Hello. Good Ramon. morning. Good morning. Good morning. No, it's afternoon here. It's afternoon. Afternoon. Good afternoon, Paul. Yes, oh. hello. How are you? How are you doing, Vivek? Hey, thanks. Yeah, sir. So, some difficulties to join you. Oh. Yes. Yes. I have a meeting at 4 o'clock, the AO Trauma Research Commission. Uh, is um, joining me uh, and the chair, so I have to talk first, I think. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me. So, Everything well in India? Yes, sir. And yeah? I... Yes, sir. It's high, high time we can visit uh, you or you yes, visit us you. live, huh? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Always busy, all you guys, yes? All you always yes. busy? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always busy. Traumatology, it will never die, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. So, Asak, sir, can you start or? Uh, so yeah. yeah, we can start. I'll give you a countdown right away. Yes, sir. Bhabal, sir. Uh, Do you have a, yeah. There are enough yes. attendants, yeah? Yes, sir. So, so we have... Yeah. Yeah, Professor Roman's attendees will be watching on Ortho TV platform. So all the discussion will happen here on Zoom. Okay, so we are going live in three, two, one. So we are live now. We can go in. Yes. Yes. Uh, very good afternoon uh, 
to all our faculties and uh, to our listeners this is the second time this uh, we are conducting the uh, this pelvis uh, symposium under the uh, banner of odisha orthopedic associations uh, so we have uh, our esteemed uh, faculties overseas faculties uh, professor paul raman professor carlos uh, sancineto and uh, uh, our national faculties so without mo- uh, wasting much time i am uh, just uh, 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 handing over this uh, platform to our professor vishwas sir to introduce our faculty so that uh, we can uh, discuss the um, topics sir okay. thank you sir vishwas sir yeah yeah uh, good afternoon good evening everybody uh, we have got a galaxy of faculties today uh, first is professor dr paul maria romans and he was also there he was the star faculty last time he has completed his medical studies in the catholic university of leuven department of kulak and leuven is a training in general surgery in surgical clinic of university hospital of catholic university of leuven He was the director of the Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology at the University Medical Center of Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz, Germany, from 2013 to till date. He was the founder and first president of the Belgium Puncture Society. He was the president of European Society of Trauma and Emergency Surgery from 2009 to 2010. He was the secretary general of the European Society of the Trauma and Emergency Surgery from 2011 to 2017. was a member of pelvic expert group of the AO technical commission from 1999 to 2014 he was AO trauma europe research chair person from 2017 to 2020 was the editor of european journal of trauma and emergency surgery he was the author or co-author of more than 500 publications of his 367 are published listed with the editor and author of eight monographic books next star faculty today is professor carlo sanzinetto is a professor head of the orthopedics from the Hospital, you know, De Buenos Aires, Chief Orthopedic Surgeon of Argentina Orthopedic Center. He is specialized in orthopedic and traumatology from the Argentine Association of Orthopedic and Traumatology, December eighteen eighty nine. Specialized in orthopedic and traumatology, University of Buenos Aires, December nineteen ninety three. Then AO Fellowship in Vesel with Professor Pietro Regalzoni from March to May nineteen ninety six. With a member of Pelvis Expert Group of the AO. SI Foundation since 2001 to 2014 with the past president D alert from 2007 to 2009 past president AOT 2017 to 18 he is a member of AO trauma technical commission he has got numerous publications to his credit as the author in AO surgery reference as the author in the fracture of the pelvis and acetabulum fourth edition 2015 contributor in chapter malunion and onion of the acetabulum professor ramesh kumar sen everybody knows him that he is his name is almost synonymous with acetabulum in the pelvis professor ramesh sen is a teacher of teachers he is right now the vice president of ioa he is currently working as the senior director and head of the department institute of orthopedic surgery max hospital mohali dr ramesh sen has got over 28 years of experience of orthopedic surgery including 20 years as faculty at pgim He has a visiting professor in Germany and USA. In addition to having been invited as the guest speaker in more than 25 countries, he is the recipient of the highest research award of SARC countries as well as Indian Orthopedic Association. He has been the chairperson of the Research Foundation as well as the vice president of IOA at present. He has pioneered the role of stem cell treatment in avascular necrosis disease of the hip joint and also got, has got a patent in his name for new pelvic plate for reconstructing the acetabular fractures. Dr. Dhawal Desai is from the Dr. Desai's Orthopedic Center, Surat. He is the chair of Trauma India from 2021 to 2024. He is the past president of Gujarat Orthopedic Association. He is a senior AO faculty of Trauma in India. He is the education of AO Trauma India from 2014 to 2018. He is a specialty is faculty education coaching pelvic acetabular trauma and orthogeriatric care. 
next to prof dinesh kale he is a professor of orthopedics from jain medical college belgaum has got many publications to his name and more inclined for more academic activities he has designed sacroiliac and screwdriver for percutaneous sacroiliac joint screw fixation and vivek trita everybody knows him he is there in most of the academic seminars symposia and everything he is a professor in jp trauma center aims new delhi he has got medical and training and experience from aims new delhi he has been a faculty at various national and international courses ao secot apa courses in orthopedic trauma he is a secot trauma committee member he has got over 100 pubmed index publications his special interests are pelvic vestibular surgery complex intraarticular fractures skeletal infection trauma and basic research and next year dr pranab saha is a senior consultant director from department of orthopedics of trauma and hip surgery seems hospital ahmedabad with the past president of ahmedabad orthopedic society is the secretary of the association of the pelvic association his academic interests are dnb teacher and ao faculty he has been a pg lecture courses is conducting a lot next is dr sinebas kasa he is a fellow in joint replacement neuro trauma fellow he is a senior consultant in orthopedic surgery from kims hospital hyderabad he is the secretary of the two institutes of orthopedic society executive member of telangana orthopedic society association he has an ao trauma faculty his academic interests are dnb teacher organize various state level and national level conference in complex trauma pelvic astral trauma and arthroplasty and last is our son from odisha dr kishor panda he is a consultant of amri hospitals bhubneswar he did is a ms from sc medical college katak from 2012 to 2015 he has got interest in pelvic astral surgery he has done fellowship in pelvic astral surgery in 2017 under professor ramesh marsen then fellowship in trauma and pelvic astral surgery in germany 2019 under professor paul romans he has got publication like polar screw in proximity bell fractures and negative pressure wound therapy in compound injury he is the organizing secretary and convener of this program thank you thank you all so palas moderator yes sir so dinesh sir uh, please take over sir hello yes, yes. yes sir hello i know you are professor ramesh casual na na peer cheppan cheppan ha na peer cheppan cheppra one minute to hear me yeah yes sir yeah i now request uh, professor romels uh, share his uh, ppt okay i'm sorry at my network is a little problem there are heavy rains here can you see my lecture now yes sir can you hear me as well yeah yes, is everything sir. fine yes okay good afternoon everybody uh, my name is paul romans i'm the director of the department of trauma and orthopedic surgery at the university medical center in mainz uh, germany i have the honor to speak to you about fragility fractures of the pelvis diagnosis classification and management and show you some of the work we did in our department on this subject during the last decades we are confronted with a rapid increase of fragility fractures of the pelvis in our european countries you see here a publication uh, from the university of düsseldorf where they looked at uh, more than 30000 patients there was a rapid increase in the fragility fractures uh, starting from the age of 80 onwards and especially in elderly women we have the same progress of uh, this incidents in uh, finland here you see a publication uh, from 2015 and the graphics you see the incidence that it's is age specific per 100000 persons for women and for men the same uh, is true for the netherlands where you see an increase 
between 86 and 2011 from uh, 5.19 to 7.14 per 10,000 population. So we have, we are confronted with a new clinical entity. And what are the characteristics of fragility fractures of the pelvis? They are always due to a low energy trauma. We have weak cortical and very weak cancellous bone in these patients. The fracture patterns reflect areas of low bone density. So we have specific fracture morphologies that we do not encounter in the high energy trauma. The ligaments are stronger than the bone and are only affected in chronic cases. The bone fails, so to say, between the intact ligaments. So we have a collapse instead of an explosion. The explosion is seen in the high energy trauma victims. And we, in a minority of cases, we see an increasing instability over time. Here you see a clustered three-dimensional bone density model derived from the CT data of 92 European persons. And uh, if you look at the left drawing, you see persons with a higher bone mineral density, and they only have small islands of ailer voids, which is a place where there is no bone anymore, between S1 and S2. If you look at the right drawing, you see the patients with a low bone mineral density, and they show large islands of ailer voids where there is no bone anymore, uh, in, situated in the sacral ala on the left side and on the right side. And sometimes there is a small island as well in the middle of the sacrum, so there can be connection between the left and the right side. And here you see an 89-year-old patient where you can very easily discover these ailer voids in the massa lateralis of the sacrum on the left and on the right side. This explains the uh, unique and consistent location of this sacral insufficiency fractures as described by Lindstrom. Sometimes we see them on one side near to the sacroiliac joint, sometimes on both sides, and also sometimes they are connected with a horizontal additional fracture at the level of S1 or S2. Another specific characteristic is the progress of instability. Here you see the conventional X-ray and 3CT cuts of a pelvis of an 83-year-old female with um, FFP type 2 C fracture. I will come later to the classification. But you see a nearly undisplaced fracture in the front and a nearly undisplaced fracture in the back. So three months later, you have the same patient that was treated conservatively with a huge dislocated anterior fracture and now a bilateral dislocated fracture in the back. We retro, uh, retrospectively looked at our own patients during three years and we found a fracture progression in about 14% of the cases that were treated conservatively. For us, these were um, arguments enough for uh, the development of a new classification system. So we looked back at the CT scans and at the uh, conventional X-rays of 245 patients that were older than 65 years. And we found out that uh, they have consistent and specific fracture um, locations, but they have a different uh, fracture characteristic and also different uh, amount of instability. We use CT scan and, and uh, uh, conventional X-rays 
but not MRI because we think that the bone is the main problem in this fragility fractures more than the soft tissues or the ligaments. So we first take pelvic overviews to rule out any pathology of the hip joint. And then we see the um, ramus um, superior and inferior ramus fractures as you see on the left side of uh, this uh, slide, on the left picture of this slide. Three months later, you see a fracture progression and you very nicely can recognize a bilateral displaced fracture in the front and a um, incomplete fracture of the sacral ala in the back. Uh, we not only look at conventional x-rays, but we additionally look at the CT scans. This is an indispensable additional diagnostic tool. And here you see the same patient with a uh, undisplaced fracture. See the left picture and three months later, a displaced and bilateral fracture of the massa lateralis of the sacrum. We should look very carefully at um, the CT scans and at several reconstructions of the pelvic ring, coronal, sagittal, and oblique reconstructions so that we can see every uh, small fissure or fracture line and then come to a correct classification. The first criterion of this cl classification is the degree of instability depending on the uh, localization of the fractures in the pelvic ring. And we distinguish four different categories with an increasing instability. The second criterion which gives, which gives the subtypes um, is depending on the localization of the fractures, especially in the posterior pelvic ring. The first type is the isolated anterior pelvic ring fracture that can be in the pubic ramus, can also be very near to the symphysis pubis or exceptionally in the pubis itself, in the symphysis itself. Uh, we have a unilateral, which is 1A, and a bilateral pubic ramus fracture, which is 1B. We looked back at 138 patients with such isolated fractures and compared them with the normal population in our state, Rhineland Palatinate. And we found out that these patients had a higher mortality, a reduced mobility, and a reduced quality of life one year after the occurrence of this fracture. So this fracture is not a um, uh, um, very simple one. It is a serious adverse event for these elderly persons. You see here some graphic of this publication and you recognize a mortality of 16.7%, whereas for the same age group, there is a mortality of 5.9 in the female and 4.0 in the male population. The second group is the largest group in our classification, and this is the FFP2. These are isolated posterior lesions, 2A, a crush lesion of the sacrum together with an anterior lesion, 2B, and a fracture of the sacrum together with an anterior lesion, 2C. The third group is a displaced fracture, be it a in the ilium, 3A, be it in the sacroiliac joint, 3B, or be it in the lateral mass of the sacrum, 3C. In the fourth group, uh, which also uh, contains this H-type fracture, um, is the bilateral displaced lesion of the pelvic ring. You see uh, two fractures through the ilium, which is the 4A type, uh, the H-type fracture 4B, H-type fracture of the sacrum, and the 4C, these are a combinations of um, instabilities on left and right on different places. What are the treatment principles of this FFP? We need an adequate pain management. 
the treatment should be as less invasive as possible. If we want to operate, we look for restoration of stability, and this is more important than restoration of anatomy, and we try an early mobilization of these patients. So our recommendations for treatment were to treat the FFP1 lesions conservatively, the FFP2 lesions conservatively first, if we do not succeed, we recommend a percutaneous stabilization in these undisplaced lesions. And in the third and the fourth group, we uh, recommend a closed reduction if needed and an internal fixation. Sometimes we need an open reduction and internal fixation. The conservative treatment should start in the hospital with adequate, adequate pain management mobilization of the extremities in bed, sitting and standing at the bedside and short transfers of the patient inside the patient room. And then after that, walking with a walking frame outside the patient room. This should be possible within one week to 10 days. If not, uh, we will repeat the diagnostics and perhaps recommend a percutaneous stabilization. We should take an X-ray control before discharge as a reference a picture for later controls. Simultaneously, we should start with uh, anabolic treatment and there we recommend the parat hormone. If we need an operative treatment, then we recommend to do it as less invasive as possible. So we prefer percutaneous techniques. And I will show you some of the different techniques that are available. The sacroplasty is the insertion of bone cement inside the fracture area. So in the lateral mass of the sacrum. Here you see an, a 68 year old female with immobilizing pain. And uh, she uh, presented in the neurosurgical department. There, it was um, the bilateral fractures were treated with bone cement. But if you look one week after the sacroplasty with the new CT scan, you see that the cement is only in a correct place on the left side, but is uh, situated in the sacroiliac joint on the right side. And there is also some extravasation behind the sacrum. And two months after the sacroplasty, patient still had severe pain. And we see here the right CT scan of this tree. Uh, we see a progress of instability um, in the back and in the front. So for us, sacroplasty is not the best method of stabilization because um, there is a high risk of cement leakage. And there is also a risk of um, fracture progression despite the bone cement in place. So we tend more to insert implants to stabilize the pelvic ring. Uh, a very well-known procedure is the iliosacral screw osteosynthesis, which we also use in high energy trauma. This is a 75 year old female with a failed conservative treatment, you see the complete fracture of the left sacral ala together with a nearly undisplaced fracture in the front. And this patient was treated with two long iliosacral screws and a retrograde transpubic screw. Uh, there are some publications that uh, give uh, good results with this type of treatment, but we are confronted with a higher incidence of uh, implant loosening. In this case, uh, we think um, the reason is that there is no stabilization in the front. So there was a still unstable pelvic ring after the iliosacral screw osteosynthesis. Nevertheless, because of the low bone mineral density, you are confronted with a smaller and lower holding power. So one other solution may be to augment your osteosynthesis with bone cement. 
This is not the same as sacroplasty because the cement is inserted through the cannulated screw and is located in the center of the sacrum in the strongest part of the sacrum. In the University of Münster, they look back at uh, 640 screw placements and found out that the cement augmented FFP patients showed a 25% reduced stay in hospital and a reduced complication risk. Nevertheless, they had um, cement associated complications in 22%, but these were mainly due to leakage but without correlation to neurological impairment. Another possibility is a transiliac internal fixator. So you place a long pedicle screw from the posterior superior iliac spine in the ilium above the acetabulum, and you connect the two screws with a horizontal bar. This is an patient with an FFP4 lesion, so a bilateral lesion of the massa lateralis of the sacrum together with a horizontal fracture and combined with an anterior instability. This was an older patient with a chronic uh, instability, so she presented months after the trauma, and we uh, decided to perform a transiliac uh, internal fixator together with two iliac uh, iliosacral screws and to perform a bilateral um, uh, double plate osteosynthesis in the front because of this bone defect due, I go back here, bone defect due to this chronic instability. And this is the situation three months postoperatively, the patient is able to walk as good as before uh, now on the last visit. The transsacral positioning bar is another possibility, but there you need a good transsacral corridor in S1, exceptionally in S2. So you use this corridor for the placement of a bar that is uh, six millimeter in diameter. It's a treaded bar and on both sides, you um, insert a washer and not so there is nearly no risk of loosening of this implant and backing out out of the bone. Um, this is a um, example such a patient uh, was 77 years old, two months of conservative treatment, fracture progression where in the left side a displaced fracture of the massa lateralis uh, in the front, you see on the one leg stands that there is a huge instability of the symphysis pubis as well. And so you see here the treatment in the back with a um, transsacral positioning bar together with an iliosacral screw and a double plate osteosynthesis in the front. We just published in uh, scientific reports the results of uh, 79 such procedures in our FFP patients. And uh, just you see that we had a one year survival of 90% uh, at one year follow up, 85% of these patients lived at home and 82% were able to walk with or without a walking aid. In the FFP4 lesions with protrusion of the spinal pelvic a segment uh, or, or uh, iliosacral segment into the small pelvis, we prefer a spinal pelvic or a lumbopelvic fixation. You see the uh, principle here. It is a one pedicle screw in L4 or in L5, another pedicle screw uh, above the acetabulum from the posterior inferior uh, iliac spine. And this screws are connected with two vertical bars and you can also interconnect the left and the right side with a horizontal bar. This is a patient at this uh, 72 years old, fall on the buttocks with immobilizing pain. You see in the sagittal CT scan, this protrusion of the 
lumbosacral segment into the small pelvis. And also here, we uh, preferred to perform a uh, spinal pelvic fixation. You see the instrumentation in the back together with two iliosacral screws and one retrograde transpubic screw in the front. If you perform an osteosynthesis in the back, you should also look at the instability in the front. And then when there is an instability, close the ring performing a, so to say, 360 degree stabilization. The type of stabilization is depending on the precise localization of the instability. It can be located at the pubic rami, near to the bone in the symphysis, in the symphysis itself, and in chronic cases, we even have a bone defect. One possibility is an external fixator with supraacetabular screws. Uh, for us, this is not the best solution. In this older patient population, there is a low holding power, lack of comfort, and after some weeks, you have a high incidence of print track infections. So we prefer the retrograde transpubic screws, the plate osteosynthesis, or even the double plate osteosynthesis if you uh, need um, a long uh, in, uh, uh, stabilization of a, a long existing defect and instability. The retrograde transpubic screw here, you see an example of that. We prefer um, 7.2 millimeter screws and the tip of the screw should perforate the lateral cortex of the ilium so that uh, you have a better holding power and a very low risk of uh, loosening of the screws. In another work, we looked back at 146 such screws, osteosynthesis, and we found out that there is a good healing um, in high energy, but also in uh, low energy fractures. So we can use it in the fragility fractures as well as in the high energy fractures. It's a reliable method with a, a low incidence of um, morbidity. The anterior plate osteosynthesis as an alternative to the retrograde screw Osteosynthesis is certainly not a percutaneous procedure if you need it because the instability is um, situated very near to the symphysis. You should use small fragment implants without angular stability and choose the longest possible part for the screws as possible. You see here an outlet view and uh, you recognize that the screws are all um, nearly 60 millimeter long. Also here we look back at um, a group of patients from our uh, department, 48 patients um, um, with fragility fractures. You see the mean age was 76 years old. And uh, we compared the single plate with the double plate. We uh, recognized a screw loosening in 45%, especially in the superior plate, and not all of these screw loosenings were catastrophic cases, so most of them we could leave it as it is. Uh, there was no screw loosening in the anterior plate, but we needed revision surgery in um, uh, the patients with single plate osteosynthesis and not any revision was needed in patients with the double plate osteosynthesis. To look at the results, the outcome of the fragility fractures of the pelvis, uh, also a recent article of uh, our uh, retrospective study, 362 patients with uh, FFP2, 3 or 4. That means that they all have a posterior pathology. Um, what we have seen that if we treat the patients operatively, that they have a lower mortality, but they have more hospital complications than the conservative group, and they are longer also in the hospital than in the conservative group. Uh, we looked 
uh, at three years, a follow-up of 38 months. And um, if you look at the patient reported outcome scores, then, then there is no difference, significant difference between the conservative and the operative group. Here you see the Kaplan-Meier curves of this uh, 362 patients. Uh, the survival is uh, similar depending on the fracture classification, but the survival is not similar depending on the type of therapy. You see on the uh, right side, the therapy for all patients, and you see that the conservative uh, patients have a higher mortality. And in the lower row, you see type 2 lesions on the left and type 3 and 4 lesions on the right. And in uh, both, you'll see a significant dif difference between operation and conservative treatment. So as a conclusion or conclusions, uh, the fragility fractures of the pelvis are a new entity with an increasing frequency. They are not comparable with the high energy trauma of the adolescents and adults. Some fractures, about 15%, we have a fracture progression over time, especially in the conservative group. The new classification system looks at the uh, specific characteristics of this geriatric fractures. The first criterion of the classification system is the degree of instability. And the second criterion is the localization of the instability uh, in the posterior and the anterior pelvic ring. The treatment should be as less invasive as possible. And uh, you have seen different alternatives for surgical stabilization. Most of them are percutaneous techniques or minimal invasive techniques. Also for the anterior pelvic ring, we can use the retrograde transpubic screw in most cases. So we have to look at the best solution uh, for each individual problem and each individual patient. I thank you very much for your attention. And if you want to read more about this uh, subject, you can um, find it in the book that we published with Springer, Fragility Fractures of the Pelvis, or in, in a review article in the GBGS. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Rommels. It was indeed a beautiful uh, article we came to see because we normally in India get very late presentations. What is your experience? in late presentation, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks down the line. Yes. Uh, then if you see chronic cases, they can be more complicated to treat than the acute cases where you have fresh fractures and uh, sometimes uh, conservative or even just percutaneous stabilization is sufficient. In the chronic cases with the huge instability and bilateral lesions, then you need more surgery. Can I ask the question? Would you advise in situ fixation? Yes. Uh, also in the yes, case. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yes. Sir. In the in the also in the chronic cases, we see that the displacement of the fractures is very small because the ligaments in the pelvic ring are still intact. So there is some instability, but not a huge one. And uh, mostly we are able to perform this uh, percutaneous fixation just as in non-displaced lesions. And this is the best for the patients but because all of these patients are old and fragile and they come with several comorbidities. So there is a higher operative risk uh, in them. Yes. yes, sir. Since sir, you are asking something. So, Professor Romans, uh, in FFP type 1 fractures, the conservative management which you told, meaning by relative restriction in the mobility for a few days, let's say you told about 10 days or 15 days, 
now a process which is uh, due to the insufficiency of the bone will this 10 days rest will actually make a difference because eventually the process is a chronic process resulting in that fracture and subsequently the patient has to be mobilized again also so will that 10 days of rest will give us a reasonable assurance that now it will not go further and it will settle down or it is likely to appear again whenever the patient is again made uh, to the, uh, his or her full abilities yeah it's a very good question. Um, I can not give you precise data, but what we have seen in our retrospective study is that some of these patients show a fracture progression and a conservative treatment. So they have another fracture, bilateral lesions or a posterior fracture, additional to the anterior one, and they come back and need surgery. But this is a minority. And it is also very important. If you look at these lesions, you, you, you know that this patient has osteoporosis. So it is very important also to start a medicament therapy, a drug therapy against the osteoporosis, be it by phosphonates, which uh, works on the long term in prevention of additional fractures. But the anabolic treatment that we start goes more quickly. This is the parat hormone therapy and it's, um, let's say it's more anabolic. So you build new bone as well. And it, it is effective, but it is not well accepted. It is less well accepted by the patients because you need an uh, injection every day and it is very uh, expensive. Yes. Thank you. So can I... For one then... last question. Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Yes. Sir, who are the candidates that we should go for the CT scan at the first visit uh, uh, with the complaint of back pain? So, so these are the candidates that we must suspect uh, insufficiency fracture or fragility fracture rather than any problem in the spine. Uh, yeah, yes. certainly uh, the, there is in many patients a mixture of pathology and a mixture of symptoms. But um, you always need a clinical examination together with your um, diagnostic um, examinations. So for me, it is e relatively easy to distinguish between a sacral fracture and a low lumbar lesion fracture, just because of the localization of the pain. If the patient lays in bed on the, on the back and you go with your hand be below the patient, so, and you press on the sacrum on the, pay, on, on the side where, which is uh, fractured, the patient always will give, say that he has severe pain. So the localization of the fracture is for me a, a very good indicator where the pathology is. If we do a CT scan of the pelvis, we will include as well the L4 and the L5 region. If there is a pathology higher up, that must be clear in the uh, clinical examination, I think. The next question to sensors, sir. Uh, sir, how often, even uh, with our Indian faculty, sir, uh, how often do we get uh, this fragility fracture in our scenario? Or whether we underestimate this fracture or something else, sir? I do not really understand your question. No, you, uh, Kishore's you question is for Indian faculty for their experience about fragility fractures. Okay. Yes. And I'm just commenting about it that we do see these cases. Our There are two issues. First, we do not have that kind of a age group still with us where the bone quality is so compromised because our uh, the age, uh, this thing survival is not as high as 90 years, 95 years old like that. But just three days, four days back, I had a patient 88 years old with the classical things which we can say as a 54 type injuries. The problem is at that age, our the attendants of the patients are not willing to get surgery done. So okay. we, we have patients, probably I may be getting about one patient every month. We don't get very many, but at least one month a patient every month, we do get it. Many of them are not willing for surgery at that stage. They feel their patient is too old to be operated upon. 
that may be instability so they tend to take the conservative approach now that was the my problem that there is nothing like a conservatively for a p2 3 and 4 kind of a fractures and that yeah. makes the situations difficult um but yes. also in europe i would say that this pathology is relatively new uh, i have looked back at the uh, literature the pubmed literature on fragility fractures and osteoporotic fractures of the pelvis and you find the first series uh, in the 1990s and this series come from geriatric departments so at that time there was no publication on surgery of these lesions it is what we do now is relatively new and it is not yet proven um, scientifically proven, I would say, that this surgical treatment is significantly superior to the conservative treatment. I think on the long run, we will prove that, but um, the series we have now in the literature are not sufficient to say we should do this surgery every time. Um, my... Um, my experience now is we get a lot of these patients now from further uh, away, not only from Mind City, but uh, the region, that um, especially the chronic cases, so the type 3 and type 4 cases where you have displacement, they ask for surgery because they already had months of pain, months of uh, limited mobility, where they need aid from their relatives or other persons, and they uh, want to find a solution. And some of these patients really ask you to operate them. Yes. But this is Sir, a changing mentality. Yes. Sir, when do you decide this uh, transiliac bar and uh, bilateral sacroiliac joint uh, fixation? So what is this? Uh, uh, yeah. We started to, to do this transiliac, a transsacral, uh, uh, transsacral bar fixation yes. because of the experience of loosening of the iliosacral screws. And because also we see uh, in a number of these patients bilateral lesions, we think a bridging osteosynthesis is better than two iliosacral screws coming from both sides. So one long bar with nuts compresses these two lesions. It's just perpendicular to the vertical fracture plane. Uh, it compresses a little bit and the patient is able to stand and walk immediately on this bar. I would say on this bar. Yeah. And um, the, the, the only... Um, condition is that you need a large enough corridor in S1 because uh, otherwise you have the risk of perforation uh, of uh, yeah, important structures. So you have to uh, look at your CT scans to reconstruct them, uh, especially the S1 region, and to calculate if the transsacral corridor is large enough. If it is not large enough, and we find, because we did also a study in the ARI in Davos with um, Asian population and uh, with CT scans of the Asian population, especially Japanese, and there you, we have a higher degree of dysplasia of the sacrum where the corridor is not available. And in this situation, we can do a transiliac internal fixation because the bar is then behind the sacrum, but you can um, connect it, combine it with two iliosacral screws as well. And that gives you an at high, an as high stability as the transsacral bar. So one Thank question you. is intraoperative. In these patients, once you pass the guide wire, do you advise to drill, under drill or Straight away put a screw after you pass a guide wire because the bone is so soft after yeah. you drill, probably your screw will just go through. Um, the, 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 the highest bone density is the ilium, 
the cortex of the ilium on both sides and the middle of the sacrum. And the parts between are very weak. So you have to bridge the weak parts and to have your, um, your, your implant must um, be situated in this dense bone. That means the transsacral bar anyway goes through and through. But if you use long screws, they should start on one ilium and this should end on the other ilium in the cortex. And then the risk is low uh, of, of loosening. That's no, my opinion. Question you was, should, you, should you drill? Yeah, yeah we start with, uh, with a lateral view of the uh, sacrum. That's and, the drill. and then we drill with a 2.8 millimeter drill, a very long drill until the other side and we leave the drill inside and we will over drill with a 4.5 millimeter. Then we remove every, everything. And then we have a canal of 4.5 millimeter. And then we insert the solid bar, which is six millimeter in this canal, always under fluoroscopic control. Okay. Thank you, sir. I think we'll proceed with the next speaker. Dinesh, Thank you Dinesh. very much. I will just uh, hear a, a few minutes at uh, my friend Carlos um, to hear his voice. And then I will leave you because I have another meeting at four. Hello, Dinesh. Dr. Desai. Hi. Yes, Dr. Desai. So I just wanted to ask Professor Romans the outcome measures of geriatric uh, pelvic and acetabular fractures have a higher incidence of complications. Sure. Or they are similar to the, to the adults. They have a higher incidence of complications, but not always related to the surgery itself. It's more the hospital stay because they are about two weeks in the hospital. Um, they get urinary tract infection, they get pneumonia, they get sometimes bed sores and so on because they cannot mo be mobilized very early. And that's the highest risk. The, uh, in our series, we have a revision rate of about 10%, which is certainly not nothing. But uh, when you look at this patient population, it's very acceptable. So one out of 10 patients needs a revision because of a hematoma or even an infection. But this is, um, yeah, I think the better you know this kind of surgery with its percutaneous procedure, the lower your complication rate will be. Sure, thank you. Please. So thank you, sir. Can we move to the next talk, sir? Thank you, Professor Romans. Thank you. Please, pleasure. Yes. Carlo, sir, go ahead. Yeah, one minute, there's a problem. I think I invite Dr. Carlos. Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon for all of you. Uh, I, I will ask Professor Romans to stop sharing the screen. If you're uh, so how kind. can I do that? I don't see it. Uh, one moment. It should be on top. Uh, stopping. Uh, okay, that's good. Okay, let's see. Yeah. Perfect. So all the best, Carlos. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to say thank you very much, all of you for giving me the opportunity to share this presentation. I would like to recognize the super lecture of Paul Roman. He's so uh, a great teacher and a good friend that I have only words to say that I, I admire him because of his job and his enthusiasm in pushing hard the knowledge in the pelvic field. And Thank you. After saying that, I would like to share some cases and our way of thinking how to resolve the late presentation of instability of the pelvis or pelvic trauma in the adult. So the objective of this lecture, first of all, is 
try to understand the different problems related with delay fractures, which is the remainder of instability or the amount of the deformity, which are, if you attempt surgical treatment, the forces to counteract and the role of different approaches and strategies. So the name of the lecture is why to operate and how. And I prefer to distinguish between why or when. So if you analyze the clinical findings of the late presentation, it, this is not a common universe because it's not the same patient when it is between the three weeks and four months period or a patient after four months. So we have to assume that some cases are uh, presented after four months period because they need to walk. And some others are related with the discomfort in the period in between. The fracture is still fresh one, but it's still not united. So we make this, distinguish, uh, this, this, this distinction according to the principles of Le Tournel. Le Tournel used to say that in the pelvic bone, there are three different periods before three weeks uh, that the bone and the fracture is mobile. In between three weeks and four months, the fracture is diminishing the amount of movement due to color formation. And after four months, it is not possible to recognize the old fracture lines because the fracture is already united. So we have to analyze our patient and ask him if he has post or her posterior pain or arterial pain of discomfort, gait abnormalities, if there is a legal discrepancy, and all of them are related with mechanical symptoms. Also, something in between mechanical and non-mechanical are neurological deficit, neurological gastrointestinal or sexual dysfunction. If those neurological findings are related to instability, you can think that you can resolve or moderate the problems of the patient after a while, but you cannot consider that mechanical problems, if you are properly addressed them, are going to resolve all the others. So we have to focus in the mechanical problems related to late pelvic presentation. If you go back to the literature, uh, the, the first report, they used to say the best result about SI joint dislocation and vertical shear fracture. So you know that the bigger the amount of force created, the bigger deformity and displacement, the worse result can be expected. So this is the rationale for the surgical treatment from the very beginning of this kind of fracture. However, sometimes we receive the patient on a late presentation. This is not so bad mobile, it's already deformed. And that situation where it used to be relatively easy to, to resolve in, in, in when the fresh fracture arrives, it's not the same on late basis. So we need to understand the problem. In order to understand the problem, we need to create our decision-making process. So we need to examine our patient with X-ray, CT scan, and most important, important in late presentation, dynamic evaluation, and of course, clinical judgment. Paul Robin said that the clinical judgment is crucial to differentiate if it's a lumbar spine problem or sacral fracture problem or SI joint problem. And in here, it is the same. Without clinical judgment, you, you must not attempt to do surgery. So it is important to define macro and micro instabilities. Macro instability is clearly evident. You push and pull the hemipelvis or you internally or externally rotate and you can distinguish movement where it should be no one. However, micro instability is indirectly recognized by the sclerosis at both sides of the steel mobile joint or a steel mobile fracture line. So in all Roman cases, in the development of the new union of the sacral fracture, it was possible to recognize this signs of micro instability. And it, it is also possible to be seen in the cases I'm going to present you. So in the understanding 
uh, process of the problem, you, you need to recognize, is this case united or not? It is mobile or not? Is painful or pain-free? So it's a fixed deformity without pain or it's a fixed deformity with pain. Do I have any chance of exploring the objectively the symptoms? That means, am I going to be able to reproduce in the radiological environment a picture that demonstrates what the patient tells me? So this is a three months old fracture in a young individual, a relatively young individual, a female of 45 years old. And you can see AP view, the severe displacement of the fracture, at three months regularly in someone of 43, 45 years old, the fracture should be united. Just asking the patient to externally rotate the, the legs in the frog position, you can see how it is, the amount of displacement in the direction of the recovery of the pelvic shape. In the reverse, if you push at the level of the greater trochanter, you can see how it increases the amount of displacement. So she was asked to remain in bed for conservative treatment with a fracture pattern that should be treated surgically from the very beginning. And, in, and this happened with this another guy. She, he suffered a bilateral ASI joint uh, dislocation and he came to me with the picture presentation on the top and I remarked the edges of the pubis symphysis of both sides, uh, pubic body of both sides. And I asked the patient to be standing in one leg down on my left. And you can see the body of the pubis was level and standing in the opposite leg. And you can see the decalage was increased almost twice. That means the pelvis was mobile where it shouldn't be mobile. So if you recognize that, it is very easy to think that the main quality of the pelvic ring is to be stable. And this one, as the previous one, both of them are unstable. The first one at three months, this one at one year and a half. So instability is not the condition of the pelvic and should be the main idea for the pelvic surgeon to regain 360 degrees of stability about the pelvis. And this is was done in this case, leveling the pubis. And I decided not to create too much trouble for, for me at the back. So I, I, I have done a tension band plating. It's very old case. Probably today I, I would try to improve the quality of the reduction of the back. And I'm going to show you that because what I'm showing you is the evolution of my way of thinking. And this is in the direction of how I did, uh, I did my own evolution. This is a case referred to as three weeks after trauma, she was infected, open pelvic fracture with multiple skin lesion, the right colostomy. So I decided to try to help with certain amount of traction and external fixation and percutaneous screwing because it was impossible due to the infection of the skin and the right colostomy to perform an inguinal approach. And this is the end result. It's not so bad. It looks much nicer at the very beginning. However, when she came to me, she was complaining of limping, left growing pain due to the union on the front, sacral pain because the sacral fracture was still ununited. But much more dramatically for me, she said, hey, doc, when I'm sitting, I move into the direction of the right side and it's painful on my low back. Okay. So is she telling me the truth? That was my, my question. I questioned to myself. If she's telling me the truth, how am I going to demonstrate why she is painful? So, and I tried to understand the problem of sitting in balance situation because I was sure that it was, she has a, or she had a sitting imbalance. Sitting imbalance is the proximal migration of one hemipelvis related to the elevation of the ischial tuberosity with asymmetric weight bearing while sitting. That results in a pelvic obliquity in the coronal plane with a lateralization of the trunk with a compensatory pseudoscoliosis 
muscle fatigue and dorsal lumbar pain that progressively increases in relation to the time the patient remains seated. That was exactly my patient symptoms. Okay, so now I, I have a, a literature which is providing me some arguments, but still this argument we are not enough to propose a surgery. So I went back to some other books and said, how is the weight distributed standing and sitting? And you can see those pictures. And you can see that while we are sitting, the leg, the leg discrepancy, it is not possible to be equilibrated while we are standing. Because if the inequality of 1.2 centimeters standing can be easily be compensated by the body itself. But when the inequality is 1.5 centimeter or more while sitting, it is not possible to be compensated because you have the same amount of deformity with less amount of or length of bone to compensate that. So those patients who have a different in height if you to recently 1. centimeter or more, they are experiencing certain amount of malalignment of the lumbar spine and pain. So, and you can see, this is the situation. You can see a cranial migration of the hemipelis, she hid in this position. And, and I, I was drawing the lumbar spine and, the, the, and both iliac crest and then the remaining spine. And you can see the deformity created by the patient when she was sitting, which was associated with the leg leg discrepancy. So how to evaluate that? So I went back to my pelvic model, the plastic one, and said, look, I need to check the different height of the, of the in the pelvis. So I decided to remove from my radiological field both femora, and we developed this uh, film that we did publish last year, the, the last update of our work with this positioning. So this is a professional model in, in the sitting imbalance x-ray position. So you can see there are no femur covering the ischial tuberosity and you can a long film to uh, understand the position of the, of the lumbar and of the, of, the, of the spine. And this is our patient. While she's sitting, she was tilting on the left, on the right direction. And in the other picture, the, I put a lift under the ischial tuberosity, equivalent to the pillow she was bringing. And then I was able to balance the lumbar spine. So I decided, okay, now I have a tool to understand the amount of displacement and the amount of correction I need. So I decided to perform, you can say a relatively rare procedure. So I thought she suffered a malgain fracture in one side. She is ununited in the sacrum, ununited in the anterior component of the opposite hemipelvis. So what I'm going to try to find a surgical strategy to resolve the, the different height of ischial tuberosities and the non-union of the anterior component of the pelvis. So I decided to create a surgical malgain fracture. This is how. And you can see this. I, I have done an inguinal approach. The green dot line is the, my osteotomy, and the red dot line is the equivalent of the Salter osteotomy, which is the other possibility to mobilize one hemipelvis, you enlarge hemipelvis by the Salter osteotomy, uh, or you ensure the, the hemipelvis by a vertical green line osteotomy. So after doing that, I pull the left hemipelvis. When I did a right to the height, I consider it was okay. I put a long screw along the, the uh, the safe corridor for the AP uh, screws. Then I use it as a pivot. I did rotate along this and then I fix everything and bone graph every fracture line. And this is the end result. It is, it is not perfect, but now the spine is balanced. So I said, okay, 
Maybe this is the way to resolve this kind of situation. And with this idea in mind, I went to some other cases. But this is another case. 14 months after trauma, with LinkedIn, daily discrepancy and sitting in bar. So I, I, my plan was, I was able to, to make a shortening of one hemipendula, but this case is centimeters, or almost six centimeters different in height. And my shortening, I know that it's not possible to be done more than three because of the traction on the sciatic nerve at the greatest sciatic nerve. So I decided I'm going to cut one hemipelvis and make a lengthening of this hemipelvis by the skeletal traction. And then I'm going to do the shortening of the other one, three centimeters of lengthening, three centimeters of shortening. So she's going to finish equalized. So in order to perform the release of the pelvis and the lengthening, you need to release everything which is already short. That means the posterior ligament. So you need to cut the ligament from the sacrum like this black line. But first of all, you need to develop a safe flap or gluteus maximus. Otherwise, everything is going to get into disaster. So this is the safe flap in the cadaver model of the gluteus maximum flap. You attach a gluteus maximum from the iliac crest like this. When it, you finish the posterior inferior iliac span, you go to the midline, the deattach the gluteus maximum from the processus spinatus of the sacrum. When you arrive to the end of the sacrum, the beginning of the coccyx, where you can recognize the gluteus maximum fiber are horizontal, you go to laterally and you mobilize the flap and then you can see the sacrotubers and sacrospinal ligament. This is the model, again, to know how to the drawing. And this is a surgical case. Sometimes the gluteal maximum is not so thin. Sometimes it's very thick. It depends on the size of the, of the muscle of the patient, <laughs> but you can go into the sacrum and they attach everything. And you can go further proximally and release the iliolumbar ligament. And sometimes the muscle of the posterior iliac crest. After doing that and cutting the already a united bone, then your pelvis is going to start to be mobile. However, not always being mobile means that you are going to be able to produce. Sometimes what I do is if the mobile pelvis is not perfectly reduced, I put the I close everything, put the patient in a skeletal traction, send the patient to the ward, and after 10, one week or 10 days, I came back to the ward for the definitive fixation. That was my plan for this lady. You can see the CT scan. The, it, it, she had a very tight and united fracture on the back. The sitting imbalance, even with a four centimeter lift, she is not perfectly compensated. So my, my plan was anterior percutaneous osteotomy of both iliopubic and ilioscale rami. Posterior is a joint approach and complete release of both sacroscopinos and sacrotubular ligament, osteotomy, wound closing, skeletal traction, work control, antiradicoid lengthening of three centimeters approximately, two weeks later, linear approach and contralateral short and osteotomy, like in the previous case. So, this is my strategy for the lengthening. And if you, you can see the opening of the hip joints, I decided too much traction. When it, it happens, I put another pin supracetabular and continue with the traction. But you can see how doing this, the right hemipelvis was descending. And then on top, you can see how it was originally. And on the bottom, the amount of correction I gained. I was able to gain 4.5 centimeters. And, and that means more than I was expecting to have. And after doing that, I decided not to perform the contralateral malgain osteotomy because both equal to velocity were on the limit. And because she was a little bit fat buttocks, uh, that means that she was able to moderate compensate. So I decided not to be so aggressive. And this is 
the previous sitting invariant situation, and this is the correction. And in the immediate post-op, you can see how the remaining of the sacrum already fractured was high and the descending of the lateral osteotomy. And this is after one year when the spine was compensating and the correction of the original deformity and the end result. This is not perfect. She had a deformity and I did create a deformity, a different one, but it was a comp the compensatory deformity, but the perfection, it's all possible if it, the patient had no fracture at all. This is another, another situation. If you take a careful look at this young individual, he was referred to us after 60 days. It looks like a both colon fracture, but in fact, it's not a both colon fracture of the acetabulum because the fracture of the ileum is overlapped, but you can see the amount of cranial migration. He was sent to his health for conservative treatment. Unbelievable. And you can see the outlet view <clears throat> and different views, and you can see the CT scan. So I, I was planning to perform exactly the same kind of treatment. So the release of the sacro, sacro tuberous and sacrospinal ligament from the sacrum. However, he had a sore lesion there, a repression lesion. So it was impossible to perform the approach where origin was described by the tunnel. So I, I was thinking how to release the ligament. So for the ligament should be the same, I said to myself, to release them from the sacrum or to release them from the ileum. So I decided to perform a limited cocker langenbeck approach. So I reached the ischial tuberosity. I released the ligament from the iliacus. And that is the, and after closing that, I turned the patient, I performed the iliacus approach. And this is the kind of the reconstruction it was possible to be done. And this is the resolution of the sitting imbalance situation and the equalization of chiobos hip joints. So different strategy when the soft tissue from the original approach are not allowing you to do that, always you can find a way to do your release. And this is a very sad situation. No sure, no doubt, she can be treated by conservative treatment. No, of course not. She can be treated with minimal invasive surgery. Maybe yes, but open reduction on terminal precision, for sure. That was the thinking of one of, of the surgeons who did treat her in the northern part of my country. She's not so bad, but we can improve it. However, that was not sure. That is, this is a result of a very bad open reduction and internal fixation. She arrived to us after three months with, with a resolution on immediate post op infection. So we decided to analyze the deformity and the description of the deformity, she has a cranial migration of the left hemipelvis, external rotation of the right hemipelvis and internal rotation of the left. In addition, she has a severe sitting imbalance. You can see the deformity of the lumbar spine with a lift compensating the, the different height of all ischial tuberosities. So we decided to perform the surgery on her. These are different approaches. You can see where she was infected. So we took the angiogram and one of the reasons of the bad situation. Okay, she had no gluteal superiority was done during the surgical procedure. So step by step, we tried to reproduce the fracture lines. So first, the release, removing everything which is avoiding us to have a mobile hemipelvis. And after the release of the left hemipelvis, we put here in a skeletal traction. You can see here the supraacetabular pin in order to have a very strong skeletal traction. And then we put her in instruction. This is a, it's a wooden table. You know that Argentina is a developing country. Sometimes we don't have resources for investing in a very sophisticated table. But if you can see that one of the primitive members of our species was Homo faber, orthopedic surgeon is also Homo faber, the man who makes. So with the pieces of the X fix, you can develop a good skeletal traction system. We fix the patient to the table in the opposite side, and we put a, a shunt pin in the 
first S1 body, and then gradually with the X fix, you had you, you can see in place we did the rotation of the hemipelvis, and we finished with this kind of contraction for the right side. So we now we have a deep rotation of the right hemipelvis. We perform an osteotomy here. We fix the osteotomy, we fix the front, but still we need to fix the left. We sent the patient to, for the recovery and we took the CT scan and we have a gap in the back. So we decided to use the, the fibula graft for bone grafting of the back anteriorly and posteriorly. We put SI joint screws and we put in a, a spinopelic instrumentation and we arrive to this kind of reconstruction, which is not perfect, which is, but it is, it is possible. And this is the evolution of this reconstruction. And she has a balanced seating and it is much nicer than the original situation, but it was too much surgery that could be avoided with a very good primary surgery. With the time to recognize that some of the problems we did face in our reconstruction is due to the lack of proper understanding of the situation. Because several times you receive a patient like this one, he says, she's not so bad. Look at the height of the uh, hip joints. But she was complaining of lumbar, low back pain and sitting in balanced condition. So <clears throat> how to improve our accuracy in the diagnosis? Well, we have three-dimensional CT scan. Of course we have it, but we took it. And then for me, it is more or less the same. I know there is a deformity. I know the deformity is in several planes, but the CT scan is not telling me where to go. It's just one helper, but it's, it's much more useful to understand the problem. So with very simple lines, we can understand the problem much nicer. So this is our film, three lines. In this case, one vertical, it should be aligned with the lumbar spine. And, and you say, okay, the lumbar spine is not aligned with this red line. Second line, parallel to the ischia tuberosity. Third line, parallel or tangent to the ischia crest. This pelvis is tilted because this is a position in the X-ray field, but it's not the real relation between, relation between the pelvis and the spine. So it should be corrected. It should be rotated. So this is the correction, very simple. You don't need nothing, and you don't need anything sophisticated, it's just your, your analysis. And I put this yellow line, this is on top of S1. Now, it is much easier for me to classify the deformity or categorize the deformity. She has a right hemipelvis which is higher than the opposite one, it is, with no bad rotation of lumbar spine, there is a rotation of the pubic symphysis because one hemipelvis seems to be an uh, obturator view, the other one is closer to the other view. So, and we can reproduce it. And, and if you do that, you can recognize the amount of deformity it was missing in your previous analysis. And you, again, with the outlet view, you correct inlet view, and also you can put this yellow line to recognize how is position one hip joint in relation to the other one. Because many of these patients in order to compensate the retro position of one hemipelvis in relation with the other that create condition for impeachment of the femoral head, they walk with the progression of one hemipelvis in order to have both hip joints at the same level. And this is interesting because you, you can distinguish that if you ana properly analyze the patient while walking. If you have a gait analyzing machine, much nicer. And then the, the spine, because she was positioned like this, and this is the reason of she was limping and she was painful standing or walking, but also sitting. And you can see, according to this line, which is the problem. And then I went to my sitting imbalance projection 
This is the normal professional model. And this is our patient. And this is the correlation. And you can see like this, the difference in parallelism in between the ischial tuberosity line, the S1 line, the lumbar spine line, and the pubis symphysis line. These are the corrections we need to recreate. Now, for me, it's much nicer because I don't have a CT scan in my OR. I have CR. With the CR, I can reproduce more or less these lines, but I cannot check the whole pelvis deformity if I was able to correct it properly or not. And this is the sitting imbalance and the correction of the sitting imbalance with a tilt. So our patient with a correction of the leg discriminant with a tilt, which is more or less the same amount because she has a little trip, uh, trap. She has a little bit shorter leg. So the sequence is like I showed you before with osteotomies and then osteotomy of the pubis, osteotomy of the back. I, 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 this is my chisel. I did the osteotomy of one hemipelvis. It was mobile, check in different projections. Now it's a little bit much better. I, and I'm going to show you another trick. This is how I fix my patient to the surgical table. Now I can create a strong traction on the opposite side because she's not going to be displaced by the traction. Then I perform osteotomy the opposite side, open the osteotomy, derotate the hemipelvis, fix the front, fix the osteotomy, fix the previous osteotomy. I was happy with this kind of resolution and I was ready to put the patient in the prone position. Everything was done in the supine, but the anesthesiology, too much time, we need to stop. Okay, I said, it's not so bad. My reconstruction is rather good. I have this kind of situation. I scheduled the patient for, uh, that was Friday night for next Monday to finish with a recover, already recovered patient. So I took x-ray to recognize if I was able or not to correct. It, was, it wasn't so bad. It's much nicer. However, there is still, a different height. And I was going to do the posterior fixation. So with this situation in mind, I took the CT scan. So on Monday afternoon, I went back to the OR and then I caudally, caudally mobilized the remaining of the hemipelvis. Uh, I tried to recover the final position. I did improve a little bit. Now we have this situation. Now, ischial tuberosities and iliac crest are more or less at the same level in all different projections, but still there is certain amount of posterior migration of the right hemipelvis, and this is due my lack of comprehension of the adequate maneuver, probably, and the other reason she suffered the fracture when she was eight years old, and in those patients who suffered a fracture while they're remaining of growing of the hemipelvis, probably at the end, the hemipelvis is going to be shorter than the other one. So full weight bearing with the correction of the deformity. And this is with the evolution. And this is one year of follow-up. Everything has already healed. This is, again, it's not a perfect situation, but it's a level situation. She now is, with moderate pain, I cannot say pain-free, but the, she is not using a, a pillow. She has no sitting imbalance and the, the, the pain is rated with, with the plate on the ear crest. Conclusion, this is a difficult surgery. Training is very demanding. Adequate results are expectable, but remember, mechanical problems and solution can be addressed. Neurological problems, sexual disorders, gastrointestinal problems remain unsolved or should be addressed by some of the specialists and they are part of the bad results when you study this patient. If you put away the no mechanical problems, the mechanical solution is very attractive and is possible to be done. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Carlos. It was just amazing. 
just to see how you have interpreted that with simple lines. The only word I can say it was an amazing talk. Thank you very much. So any question, Pranav sir? No, no, I was just going to say the same words that Dr. Dinesh Kale was saying. We were mesmerized by this talk. And uh, it seems that there is so much more to be learned in pelvis after hearing uh, Dr. Carlos's talk. So I think we'll have to call him uh, to India and we'll have to keep him here for a few months. <laughs> See, okay. We will get plenty of such cases. It's a deal. get plenty of such cases. Can I ask one question, please? Yeah, sure, please. Yeah, Carlos, that was excellent as always. And it always gives us a stimulus to learn more and more in pelvis whenever we feel that we have attained a height in pelvis fractures. Uh, and thanks for your article, which we published in JCOT. That was, that's also very helpful for us to understand the ischial weight tuberosities discrepancies. How do you decide in your cases of delayed? We have tried on around five to eight cases. I have done of malunions around six weeks to roughly three months. How do you decide which patient requires soft tissue releases and which one can be just, just done with bony procedures or all patients of malunion require releases of the ligaments first, traction for a few weeks or so, and then subsequently a second surgery where you can do bony procedures. Okay. It's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, if you have a rotational deformity, you can go without any in, in inconvenience with the restoration of the anatomy because um, ligaments are a problem when you have a vertical migration, a cranial migration. Right. Because we were taught that the ligaments of the pelvic floor where to avoid certain of vertical movement. In, in reality, what I learned from experience and from the, my surgical cases and some anatomical dissection, that once the cranial migration has already happened, the pelvic floor is retracted. So even if you cut the bone and you try to reposition it, due to the retraction of the pelvic, well, pelvic floor, you can finish, I, I don't have, excuse me, I have a pelvic model here. Sure. Sorry. Okay, can you, can you see this? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Suppose you have your, your ligament like this, mm -hmm. and this hemipelvic is high, so when it's high, this distance is shorter, just, okay? So if you cut the bone and try to recover high, maybe you're going to recover the high media crest, but while you're moving down the hemipelvis, the ischial tuberosity goes to the center because the tension here is creating condition in order not to properly mobilize the hemipelvis. So for that reason, you need, you need to cut the ligaments. You, you cut the ligament, you release. You, you have to deattach completely the hemipelvis from the sacrum, and that is only possible if you cut the bone and release the ligament. There are few cases where you can mobilize in first step. In my experience, sometimes you improve just by pulling during the surgery, but it's not enough because you have already released the bone or cut the bone, released the ligament, but still you have psoas muscle, abdominal muscle, mm -hmm. spinal muscle, they are short. So yes. by pulling by traction gradually, this muscle can be mobilized and with limited risk on the neurological structure because the patient is awake and it's telling you what happened. You can control the, the food model. Okay, you say, no, we are a rich country. We have uh, potential evoked and we can check that. Yes, of course. Sometimes we, we, you, when you mobilize 
in one step and the uh, evoke potential tell you hey, something is happening, you don't know really what is going on because we are using this for a spinal surgery. Usually they tell you, the, the neurologists tell you that something is wrong and, and you haven't finished your correction. So in my experience is okay, I do not hesitate to put the patient in skeletal traction, which is the original treatment for the malgain fracture. So those cases I can resolve with moderate traction in, on first step, okay. If I cannot do it, skeletal traction, gradually increasing the, the, the weight, and for sure you can improve the quality of your fixation. This, the day of definitive fixation, I do the surgery under the skeletal traction. So my clamps are, are just approaching the pieces of bone, or I do a screw fixation, a screw reduction, but the, the, the reduction is not by the clamps. The reduction is by the traction. Right. Across, and then sure. when you align your fragment, it's easy because your vector is smaller. Otherwise, you have to create strong force. There is no clamp. You, you don't have where to clamp to properly descend one hemipedis. You need the ejection of the traction. Right. And of course, as any other procedure, when you need to open and close, the infection rate rises because you open the patient is, is lying on the surgical approach and you are going to open it again. So I do not use stitches, I, I, you intradermic suture. I mean, nothing in touch. I cannot see the suture or nothing. And then crossing fingers. Okay, thank you, thank you. I very well. from my side. Uh, when we are doing this kind of a lengthening to a proximally shifted, we understand that if it is a relatively a fresh injury, the neurovascular structures have actually shifted up. So the safety limit of two centimeter or whatever we can say can still be longer because of the proximal shifting, we do have a play. But in a long standing deformity, let's say a year or two years or three years, there is a sufficient contracture formation. And in that state, a kind of a barrier says that you can't more than 2 centimeter or 2.5 centimeter or maximum 3 centimeter where your risk of neurovascular surgery is like a neurovascular complications likely to be high. So have you done any case in which you have done in stages first you did about 2 or 3 centimeter and then you again went subsequently for the second time retract, uh, second time stretching or not or you have shifted to the other side to correct. Yes, okay. Uh, I have a short answer to a good, very good or excellent question, or I, I, can, I can develop a longer one. My first correction was uh, the conventional one. I have done the approach uh, proposed by Letournel. I released everything and was able to reduce everything. But it was only one month old. So it was in the period, in the second period of Letournel. That was very easy. So that almost acute. This is not a late referral, at least in Latin American countries or developing countries. Maybe it is the same in India. You cannot say uh, one month or 60 days is a late referral. But if you go to the United States or Europe for then two weeks is a late referral. I, I, I've been discussing with English surgeons saying no, after three weeks, you cannot attend surgery. Look. All my cases are coming after three weeks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, this is something between friends. We are in the part of the world where, which is impossible, we need to manage with, the, with it. Yes. Second issue: when the fracture is already healed and everything is retracted, it is extremely difficult to mobilize. That means after four months, after one year, after five years. The last case I did show you it was after eight years. So it's, it's a long time. However, you have to understand the spirit of, of the soul of your lesion. Um, I thought that, and I think that it's easier to short one hemipelvis than to enlarge the opposite one. The problem is you are going to be the shortening the one hemipelvis which is healed, sound, no, which has no real problems. So this is a very strong medical legal argument if you fail. 
because everyone is going to accept a complication in the already injured side. No one is going to accept happily a complication in the heel side. In this case, I show you, I, I have done the shortening because it was ununited in the front and she was symptomatic in the front. So I needed to fix the front anyway. And the sacrum was ununited in the back. So I didn't want to create too much pressure on the sacrum by doing the lengthening. That, uh, you have to remember that was one of my primitive cases. So my, the rationality for me was the shortening is part of the treatment of the non-union of the front. And she had the right colostomy. So I was working in the left hemiparium. That was a very safe area for the, for the surgeon. But for sure, the shortening is a very good idea because you can, the shortening of two, three centimeters is nothing for the architecture of the pelvis and you can do it almost percutaneously. When, when you recognize which is the safe corridor for the osteotomy, you mobilize the, the hemiparis already osteotomized and then you can put just percutaneous screw and it's going to be a big bone to bone situation. St step procedures are going to be performed in my place when after a complete release, you are pulling and nothing is happening or very little is happening. You put the lamina spreader and you can open it widely, but when you pull, nothing is happening. The other problem is, is that you do your release in the prone position. Where the patient is prone, the release hemipelvis is going back because of the, of the body weight. It's a, it's a problem of Mr. Newton, the gravity. But if you turn the pain and you put in the supine, the gravity is working in your favor, not against you. So my rationality is if I cannot do it easily in one step, I release everything, put the patient in traction. Sometimes with the first step, I, I can gain two centimeters, but I need to gain four or five. So I put, if I have any complication, I, I what I gain, I screw it and go to some other place because sometimes those patients are bleeding a lot. And if you don't have a good anesthesiologist, uh, it, it's better to preserve the patient for step by step. That happened to my last case. So, and then when I put the patient supine, I can fix the patient properly to the table. The procedure can be longer. The anesthesiology feels much more happier because it can control the airway easily. The, the, the traction can be done in a proper way. Gravity is my favor. And then I can use percutaneous screwing for the long SI joint osteotomy. And I can pull in, in an oblique vector to the ceiling of the OR. And then I can gain adequate reduction without, without a second big approach. And if I need to increase the stability of my assembly, I turn the patient prone again and I put the tension banding or uh, the spin, the spin of pelvic instrumentation. I'm not so sure if this is a very long question to an, an excellent, uh, a very long answer to an excellent question, but this, this is our way of thinking. And for sure, Ramey, there is no Bible, there is no Quran, there is no religious, uh, uh, book that tell you this is the first amendment uh, uh, commitment and this is no you there are no no fixed rule i fixed point where it should be released and you are like my my personal training was done not with any mentor it was done with my patient so you it's like this you are walking along a very long tunnel blinded and touching the walls and discover in the end, just many times by coincidence, by analysis. What we found it out that when we have sent a patient on traction after doing the initial release, at the time we could see that we could have a release, but subsequently after that traction, which is given by the patient at his home or maybe at his place at two weeks, three weeks, still we do not get that kind of an impact. So that was one problem we found with that traction release and send. If we are making that traction within the hospital setup is a different thing where it is no. controlled. My, another question, yeah. See, my another question is 
that if there is a problem at the sacral leg joint which is disrupted and probably painful also maybe after a year i am again talking about as you are rightly said it our delay is more than a year or something something so at that stage will you go through the for the release through the same sacral leg joint or will you still search a safer area later uh, either way what i do not recommend is go to the old fracture line of the sacrum i've done it only once it was okay for the release but after the and put the patient in traction but the day of the fixation, I increase the traction and I damage L5. But if you go, if you have an SI joint, you can cut along the SI joint without any, any trouble. If you have a sacral fracture, I go parallel to the SI joint and I create an osteotomy parallel to the SI joint. It is much nicer because the SI joint is this size one centimeter and a half lateral to this edge, you have this surface area of contact. So my, my rationality is, I have a sacral fracture which is elevated. If I cut the SI joint, which is fixed, and I try to reduce the hemipelvis, I, I will finish without bony contact. In the reverse, if I cut parallel to the SI joint, and you can see, you can see the, the, the can you see here? Yes. This, the amount of contact is limited, but if you cut here, just a the amount of contact, can, can you see? Uh, if you cut up, we are not able to see it. Yes, now we are able to see it, yes. If you cut here, okay, from the back, if you, cut, if you go here, the amount of contact is limited even in, in a good situation. But if you cut here, look at the Arros, amount of- please contact. hold the uh, model. Yeah, that's it, that's it. Uh, I, I, because I cannot see my own. But if you cut here, the amount of contact is maximum. So you can descend the hemipel, you can forward the hemipel, and still you're going to finish with contact. That's the reason you can fix it with SI joint screw, because you have extremely good bony contact. But what about even non unions Non-union non, non of malunion of the sacrum. No, non-union. You have a non-union overriding and the fracture is not yet breached. Now, will you go through the same fracture or you will still go parallel? If I have a non-union of the sacrum, I do the same. Because what I, I need to increase is in the healing rate. And the healing rate, even of the non-union of the sacrum, is by compression. So I cut the ilium, mobilize the hemipelvis, align the hemipelvis, and then fix through the osteotomy, through the non-union, go into S1. I do not touch the non-union of the sacrum because if you want to release the non-union, you are going to be risking your, your roots. At the end, your sacrum is going to be like this. But it doesn't matter. If it's already healed, this, you, you are not running a marathon for the anatomical reconstruction of every detail. Your marathon is to gain stability, 360 stability. So if the hips are in proper position, the ischial tuberosity are in proper position, the iliac crest in proper position, who cares what happened in between? It's like a diaphysial fracture. If you are going to use Conventional plating, you need anatomical reduction. If you're going to do bridge plating, MIPO technique, you need a bridge. If you're going to use a nail, you're going to be bridging the fracture. Allow Mother Nature to do its work and you have to do your own work properly. Okay. I think that clears the point very well. Yeah, you said you do shortening on the normal side. Exactly, shortening means you do an osteotomy and create a malunion of overriding or you remove some part of a bone there to create a shortening. No, when, when you do a vertical, you think about malgain fracture. Malgain fracture is a vertical fracture in, in one part of the pelvis. So by the action of the abdominal muscle, psoas and everything, the hemipelvis is going upward. So you just make a cut and, the, and, the, and, and then you push the, the, the lower leg or the, the limb 
And then with the, with the forceps and the iliac crest, you elevate and you can see the amount of correction you have created because you can see in different height of the iliac crest. I said, look, I needed two centimeters, it's two centimeters. I need three, it's three centimeters. More than three centimeters, if you take a look to the, can you see the, the greater sciatic knot because I cut through the greater sciatic knot, sometimes can create some tension in the sciatic nerve. And provided it's the uninjured side, it's, it is not nice to have a problem with the sciatic nerve. But three centimeters is not a problem at all. At least in the cases I have done. Because you know, if the, if you, your patient is 1.95 meters, it's not the same if your patient is 143 meters. So three centimeters is not a fixed rule, it's related to the size of the patient. But on average person, three centimeters of shortening is not a big problem. Then you need to reshape the iliacrete for the reattachment of the muscle, and you can use part of the excess of bone as bone graft, but it, it works properly. So, Kaiser, so, so we can discuss more and more in the case presentation also. So, Kala sir, can we move on to the next talk because the yes, time? Yes, I will invite you, Kasha. <laughs> yes, present his cases because the talk was excellent and the discussion will. Really I, th I think all of us should clap for that. Yes, it was absolutely an yes. amazing talk. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Yes. 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 Thank you, Kale. Yes. Uh, that was really an amazing, after an amazing talk. Uh, uh, I have a small question to Dr. Carlos. This is a simple question. You have used a wooden table to which you have fixed your fixator. So do you do surgeries on wooden table? How is the go? How does it go? This is a real wooden table because I'm going to tell you. Uh, when I did a start, there were no good resolution tables available. So I, I decided to manufacture, and I, I, I was in, in, in United States, they were using regular table, but they were not able to see the, the pelvis properly to accurate C. So then I went to Paris and Leton was using a traction table, very sophisticated, but it was impossible to buy something like this in, in Argentina. So when I came back, I said, look, and it's, and I remember that the cardiology, the cardiac surgeon, they use a wooden table for the peacemaker position. I said, look, this is the solution. What I need is something like this. I make it narrower for the CR to mobilize because it has nothing in the middle. And then when I tried to buy a Jackson table or something similar, it was 250,000 US dollars. At that time, my wooden table cost me $200. Very simple. If I'm going to invest money, I prefer to buy a CR and not a table. But I, I, if, you, if you are working in a very rich hospital and they are going to provide you everything, it's, you can do it in a carbon. Now we have a, a fiber carbon table, which is very nice but I do not attempt to put my chance screw in this fiber carbon table. I do it for some other procedure, but I'm not going to destroy this, this table that was very difficult to, to be bought by the hospital. It's, it's not the Jackson table, but you can understand that. Great, thanks. So, so let me just, go to the case. This is a 25 year old male I fell from second floor. Uh, and the present I could not get the x-ray because I'm directly presenting the CT scan. You can make a impression. So clinically he has got decreased perianal sensations as well as uh, bladder sensation is also lost. 25 year old male. So let's just make it in some interactive. Kale sir, what could you make? Kale sir. You're asking me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
there appears to be a sacral fracture that is obvious there also there is some amount of overriding on the uh, as if you want to draw lines as shown by carlos this is a fresh case yeah i don't fresh case but there is also an yeah. element of si involvement on the other side also okay the si opening little bit on the other side besides the injuries on the, this side okay i'll just show you the sections as well it's a bilateral All, sacral fracture always look for lateral sagittal views ct scans in such fractures lateral. 2d scans hello yeah. always look at sagittal yeah. lateral 2d scans to look at what exactly is the fracture the 3d this scan does good. not give us so you can see the spinal pelvic dis fractures and the flexion injury with type 4 or type 3 sort of an injury royal camille and that is the reason which you need to and there's because i that's my protocol that's for the residents i'm saying out here the people who are learning that ct scan sagittal view whenever you see two fracture lines going in the sacrum always look at the sagittal ct scan 2d mid sagittal that is going to tell you whether it's a spinal pelvic dissociation or not any other ct scan films or egg views may not give you that proper views be it 3d axial or coronal sagittal ones are the ones excellent point sir uh, after this this sequence the one which you are asking for yeah so here you can see the s1 s2 to s2 yeah. s1 is basically usually through s2 that you will have the perianal sensations will decrease when the s2 fracture is there yeah. so s1 s2 is going to go and that has gone posteriorly it is not complete but it is partial so it can be uh, odd type of a classification one or three whichever way you look at it i would go in for a spinal pelvic distract it reduce it depending upon an acute fixations if it is old you said it's acute so we can get the distraction by spinal pelvic and a triangular osteosynthesis for this else if it is an old we many a times we have done the laminotomies laminectomies and the sacral decortication of the posterior dorsal cortex and just given them adequate areas for the spine to have decompression vivek the only problem is how do you disengage the uh, sir if you do a acute fractures you go through the s1 do we want to explore the card and then decompress no, uh, that's what can i'm saying in, yeah. in an acute case you can just go for l5 or l4 spinal pelvic with the sacroiliac screws the s1 sacroiliac screws which you put which are going into the lc2 cor corridor and then with that once you distract your threads with like the you do in a spine fractures then this s1 and s2 are going to go and distract the problem happens in reducing them in the flexion type but once you do that with an acute injury in a prone position by some pressure you can easily get that the problem is in late presentations which we get which where we might have to do a decortication and just leave it no it will distract but how will you uh, de hinge that uh, angulation because so have, that you can do with your uh, you have the rods and the rod pushers along with the spine rod pushers you can first distract it and if you require you can also use the lysis sort of a screw if you want the spondylar lysis screws by which you can how you bring your spondylar lysis back to the position the same way you can bring it here but will your spino pelvic distraction distract s1 s2 yes because you are putting the s1 the lower screws which are being put in the sacrum that is going to help you i think uh, we can consider this fracture in such a way that your both iliac crests and the uh, remaining sacrum is one fragment and your uh, s1 s2 central body and the spine is another fragment Yes, and you yes, can yes. combine it with a pelvic lumbo pelvic fixation and that will be able to give you the reduction perfect perfect so uh, any inputs if you look at it as a spondyloptesis 
of a spondylolysis, which is grade four, it usually goes at L5, S1. Now this has gone at S2, S1, S2 level. Since we cannot go in an S3 and put it and push up the lysis, we use the sacroiliac corridors and in the distal part and then try to distract them. That's how it can be done. Many a times it will not come if it is below S2, but then you many a times will have to leave it also if it is at the level of S2 or below it. And here the laminectomy helps yes. de-roof it. Yes. If okay. it is done, that's what I said, acute, Correct. you can still get it because as soon as you try to distract, how your spine comes back whenever you are doing a dorsal lumbar yeah. spine kyphosis, it just comes back when you distract it and you push in with your rod pushers. The same way it can be done even in an acute case. If not, then you will have to decorticate it. You got that. So, like uh, Pr Dr. Pranav told, uh, both iliac crest and pelvis, along with sacral ala, is as a single unit has moved into flexion, something like this. Into extension. It is actually into okay. flexion. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Into flexion. And that has ca uh, caused, you know, the nerve, you know, caused uh, these things. Uh, making it, you know, thin. And uh, so I went, in this case, I went dorsally and decompressed that area. And uh, uh, I could get the decompression. I have not reduced it, but fixed it in situ with that. But how did you fix? Spinopelvic. Spinopelvic. Okay. 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 And uh, so the patient uh, went, he, he was actually from uh, you know Bihar who came for work in uh, Telangana. And after COVID, uh, he has sent a video. So that's how he walks. He, uh, he has regained his bladder, uh, regained his boil sensations, is doing walking and doing his activities. So, uh, the one, uh, in conclusion, the point which is already made by uh, Dr. Vivek Dika, so sagittal sections, they give uh, the good kind of information more than the 3D CT scans. Uh, when you have something, some, uh, some kind of a flexion injury uh, or a H kind of a fracture, uh, at the sacrum. In one of so, the cases, we have used towel clips. That's it. Thank you. Both the spinous process and try to, you know, pull it back. But we couldn't succeed. Mm -hmm. Finally, we just decompressed that area. He regained completely because I don't have the photographs to put up right now. That, uh, Dr. Kale, the trick is that you do it as early as possible. I have yes, got no. both the cases. We have done the towel clip method. We have used some sublaminar sort of a wires also to reduce them in the sacrum. And if it is an acute within five days or so, it definitely comes back very early and easily. However, as soon as it gets delayed, the inner pelvis, whatever structures are there, they are getting contracted maybe. So you may not get a complete reduction of that. And that's when you might have to do, as you have rightly said, the cortical decortication. Sometimes the full 100%, we have been able to correct 70% of that and bring it to 20 to 30% of overlap, which was fully gone around. So that can be done, requires some dissection, but spinopelvic helps you as soon as you distract it. Most of the things bring it back. One trick which has been tried was that we use a plate on the either side, on the lower fragment, and then with the manipulation and screwing a kind of a you can say using a plate as a lever to get that reduction done and then put the proximal screw over the sacrum only. So distally put the screws, handle the reduction, proximally pushed it back to this anatomical position and we could reduce that deformity also. Obviously, it was after the decompression was done. Okay. But in this case, sir, uh, the dorsal cortex was intact. Yes. Uh, it was okay. internally into the uh, spinal canal, it uh, got displaced. Okay. So in this case, we need an interconnecting rod or uh, we don't need an interconnecting rods to both the hemipelvis? So it's 
basically it was in the you know that sagittal plane it has uh, uh, got deformed and you yes. have uh, both sides uh, you know you know fixation which is angular stable okay there is a controversy there is a controversy regarding the spinal pelvic transverse rod fixations you will find that half of the pelvic or the spinal surgeons say that when you are doing a lumbar pelvic fixation you should put in a transverse rods when you are doing l5 and s1 or l4 and s1 and there are half of them who many a time say that the transverse rods is not adding rather it is uh, it is not helpful at all and should not be put so some people are very vehement in not putting a transverse rod i am i do not know the reason but there is a lot of controversies when you try to do this the transverse rod fixation i think after the fixation we can check the stability on table itself and if we find that there is a the two rods are not parallel and they are moving uh, then we can put connecting rods otherwise we may avoid it actually so, when it is a older injury it is better to put it yeah in yeah. a fresh injuries because the stability is reasonably achieved so you may not have it but in older injuries we have found it is useful yes very right sir because what happens when you are distracting in an older injury what happens is that your hemi pelvis is they flare up they go medial laterally they in, they open up when you are reducing it vertically or bringing the length back in vertical direction with the distraction on instead of going vertically they go at 45 degree angle and it opens up medial laterally as well so that's why the triangular osteosynthesis is usually done for iliosacral screws and it also adds the transverse rod also ensures that your sacrum does not open up when you are distracting the vertical distraction so professor carlos your input on this transverse rod Okay. 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 So we can move to the next case. Uh, yeah. So I will call Doctor Vivek to come forward. Can you see the screen? hello yes, yes we can okay fine so it's a very it's a simple case a written complex but it's a simple one uh in the sense that we should be how a standard pelvic injury when it comes to us should be managed and that's what we would like to discuss it has got few components on both the sides of pelvis so that may help us to have a good discussion on both the types of fractures that we see especially in a pelvis injury so he was a 40 year old male which was who was hit had some abdominal injuries which were treated conservatively and was having pain in the pelvis and this is the x rays which were which we had you can see that he was having a binder on initially and that's how he was being treated so i'll just go about i'll finish it and then we can have the discussions on various this when we in what next we normally and when the patient is stabilized we get the ct scans done so this is for this is not as complex as dr carlos or shrinivas has shown this is a simple acute fracture a classical usual presentation which we see when we have these sort of a fractures so this was the ct scan and these are the axial views of both that sides of ct scan this is a 3d ct scan showing you a complete orientation of how the fracture lines are going so if i'll just stop here for the people who are listening to this besides the moderators and the experts out here how do we classify this and that's the question and how we go about managing this fracture so that should be in our mind first of all it will be a very hemorrhagic or acute we can see it's involving both the hemi pelvises so we should be having a good acute management of such cases i have broken it down into 
diagnosis on the right side and diagnosis on the left side for the people who are listening to this so that we let's analyze it properly sequentially if you see on the right side there is an si joint which has got fractured as well as dislocated you can see a fracture line going in the ilium which has got the opening on the anterior side of the si joint and the fracture line going midway into the ilium so this and if you see the axial scans we can see it is roughly at around halfway 40% of from the anterior side that we are having this sort of a fracture so it's a these are usually an lc type 2 sort of injuries known as crescent type of injuries and if you see the right lower 3d scan you can classically see the crescent or the posterior sac ilium which is intact and is in continuation in ligaments with the sacrum so that gets broken down because of the iliolumbar ligament in a crescent sort of a fashion and that's why this injury is known as crescent injury as per days classification this is a classified or by martin bircher from uk so this is type 1 is anterior one third type 2 is intermediate and type 3 is lower down very posterior and based on this sort of an axial scans we can decide how do we treat these crescent injuries so that was regarding the right side and if we just concentrate on the left side what we see is is a si joint dislocation but with no fracture having both opening up of the anterior si joint and posterior si joint both in the axial and the coronal sections which we can see so both the anterior and posterior ligaments are broken which may be a type of apc apc or an external rotation injury which has caused one of the hemipelvis to get compressed and the opposite side to go into external rotation and that's what brings us to the diagnosis which is an lc3 sort of an injury which is more complex than lc2 which is not only involving one hemipelvis it is involving both the hemipelvis pelvises one side is lateral compression and the second side is having an open sort of an injury day is type 2 so i'll stop here and we can have discussion on how do we go about managing definitive treatment for such fractures the moderators may please give their analysis and comments sir is there any vertical component uh, in the uh, in the pelvis yes. in the, this is without a traction so it's not a major yes on the left side when there is an apc or a complete disruption of the hemi pelvis as we see on the posterior side both anterior and posterior joints are opened up there can be a vertical component but that's how all the type c parts behave when they are opened up completely the ligaments which dr carlos is breaking in the end after one year for the malunion reduction that's what has happened right now acutely so it can go up or it can come down as you want it to is yes, that is the confusion with this type c and uh, vertical uh, injury sir uh, means because uh, all type c can have a vertical displacement based on the muscle pulls because the ligament which is holding them are i think not there so the vertical the spinal muscles the erecti and the quadratus lumborum they can always pull them as there is no stabilizing ligaments which are available so both vertical shear and apc3 on one side will more or less behave in a similar fashion depending upon which component of injury was more prominent at the time of impact okay. and further it is a tilted pelvis is not a horizontal structure it is a tilted structure so whenever there will be disruption the ligaments it will automatically move little superior so that is a natural displacement it will never be pure posterior it will be always posterior superior Right. So for planning the treatment, I would want you to answer three questions. One, 
what is the hemodynamic status of the patient, whether he has been resuscitated. Second, what is the soft tissue condition of the patient? And third, what is the neurological condition of the patient? The very fact that 3D CT scan has been done, I, in our hospital, it will only be done when it is hemodynamically stable. So all these things, all the three factors are purely under control. There is no issue. This is not a complex case. I am not making it complex. This is for learning process. I want because we have got both the sides where we can learn most of the pelvic treatment management in this sort of a fracture. So that's why I put it. There is nothing besides what I am showing. It is a simple fracture pattern which is slightly complex in nature. Yeah, so I think what we have to do here is we have to do a reduction and that reduction will be mostly assisted with traction and external fixator if required from the front. And once we are able to, to get some amount of reduction, we will do a iliosacral screw on the left side to get a compression. And we will also do a iliosacral screw on the right side. But at the same time on right side, we have to be sure that the reduction is good. So we may have to do a limited open reduction to confirm the reduction. Okay, so that that is what brings me and I would like the experts and all the moderators also to discuss that. That how do you decide if such a fracture comes, especially the crescent? Whether because crescent, I'll show you later, that can be treated both for prone position as well as supine. And if you really want to control the crescent displacements, it is said that if you go prone and fix it both vertically and horizontally, that is going to help. In such a fracture pattern, what will be your position? Sequencing of right side and left side and positioning of prone or supine in your setup because that is the next question which will automatically come for a surgeon. My uh, stepwise would be, I will handle the right first prone position, reduce the crescent. Once reduce the crescent with a plate, you, you can use a calcaneal plate, which has got a big hole, which can take a sacral screw. I mean, we have used a calcaneal plate in the reverse way, where the big hole that you see in the calcaneal plate, that is the only hole through which you can pass the sacral screw. So this calcaneal plate can reduce the crescent before you pass the screw, because on the left side, there is a distraction. So you will have to pass a guide wire transsacral from right to left, reduce the left one and pass a screw then from left to right. If you try to hold the reduction and pass a guide wire from left to right, it is extremely difficult to do that. So you reduce the right, pass a long guide wire from right to left, and then pass a transsacral screw from left to right, which will act as a compression screw. Okay. Anybody else? Carlos, Dr. Sain, anybody? Dr. Uh, Srinivas, yeah, please. Carlos. In the case of a polytrauma patient, uh, I prefer to treat everything in a supine position. Yes. Uh, your patient has a, a sling, as I recognize by the clamp in the AP view. So this is moderating the amount of displacement. But for sure, this, both sides of this kidney pel or of this pelvis are vertically unstable. Because the crescent fracture, even if it's coming from a lateral compression mechanism, it has a vertical displacement right now. And the opposite side, the SI joint, has a vertical instability. You can see the transverse process of L5 is already fractured. That means that all the ligaments are yes. just. So it doesn't matter which is the mechanism of injury. I prefer to consider the anatomy of the fracture, I mean, where is the point of instability. And for me, the, I, I will start with the left, the SI joint, which is possible to be done by close means, no sure about that, for sure, no doubt about that. Um, if the reduction is not perfect, you can put a chance pin in the iliac crest and use it like a joystick. If it's not enough, you can put a second shunt pin in the supracetabular region and connecting both shunt pin with the bar, you have a wonderful reduction tool. I use it several times because you can de-rotate in different planes the hemipelvis until you reach a good reduction. Then I fix it with, with SI joint screw. After finishing that, you can do the same for this crescent fracture. And, and I have experience in manage, the management of crescent fracture by close reduction and percutaneous fixation. You have 
big amount of bone in, in the remaining of the SI joint in, in, in the, the part of, of uh, associated just with the ileum and not with the sacrum. But if your screw are going to be at the level of the fracture line, this is not a big problem. What I use is a three holes, 4.5 recon plate. And if you use 6.5 screws, even 7.0 screws, you can go through the plate and you can use the plate as a reduction tool and as a big washer. And then you put your SI screw through the plate in the conventional way. And usually it is stable enough for avoiding to put the patient in the prone. Uh, sometimes what I use is a long screw that, that's coming from the front to the back. And this screw goes at the level of the post anterior inferior spine, a little bit lateral, two centimeters, and you can reach from anterior, the posterior aspect of the ileum, and you can check it with the inlet view very nicely. And you can add in the view plus obturator of light view. And then you can see the trajectory of your K wire or your drill bit or your screw. And then you can increase the stability by fixing both iliacos component. And for the anterior component, if you are able to use retrograde uh, screwing, this is going to be a damage control strategy because the amount of bleeding by doing everything in this way is minimal in a polytrauma patient. If the patient needs much more stability in the front and the patient is hemodynamic and stable, I do not hesitate to open uh, through a final steel approach and you can call it a stop approach or whatever you want to call it. And, and, and you can use a bridging plate from one hemiparet to the other. But with this fracture pattern, if you have very nice quality of bone in the back and good screw fixation in the back, you can try by screw fixation in the front because the amount of stability, extra amount of stability in the front with good fixation in the back is, is limited. But for sure, I will try to fix the front also. Right. Right. So if your patient is not, is, is not as good enough in, in terms of hemodynamic stability for continuing with surgery, just X fix in the front or in fix in the front, but no doubt that on acute basis, you should fix the SI joint in order to avoid further displacement and much more difficult resolution. Thank you. Thank you for a nice and elaborate way of managing these injuries because that clears many of the points. Dr. Saint, sir, if you would like to add something. No, here. basically I also feel that I'll be doing it in a supine position. Obviously, left is not likely to give a issue, but on the right side, I will have something, an attempt at close reduction. And if I find it is difficult, even by putting a shans pin into the ileum, I'll go with the lateral approach, the standard approach anteriorly, get that reduction properly, and put a plate down there and up there. And that will be my simple this thing rather than struggling to get that fixation. So I'll just have that simple thing. And in front, obviously. It could be that we may use a fenestrate or we may pass a percutaneous screw fixation. Right. So I'll just like for the audience to see the 3D CT scan because that's what was highlighted by many of the analysts out here. You can see on the left side, the transverse process of L5 is broken. Along with, if you see the sacrospinous on the spine, on the sacrum, you see a bony fragment on the left side again. And that is again showing you on the first 3D CT scan how the ligaments have ruptured both on the transverse process of L5 and the sacrospinous ligament has got a bony avulsion from the sacrum many a times. So these are subtle points which tells you how the ligaments have broken out, especially in these ligaments of your APC injury or whichever injury vertical shear where your ligaments of the hemipelvis are coming. The questions have already been answered regarding the positioning, which was my first question regarding position, management strategy regarding right side or left side. And it depends on your surgical preference, which one you want to push and go ahead first. Positioning, as was said, I think that uh, in my hands also, I normally go supine because most of them are polytrauma patients and they help us in managing these injuries. 
we managed him initially for the 24 to 48 hours and then i took him up and fixed all his fractures at one go after managing him with the binders on so this is what we took him on the supine i managed i tried to do the left right side where the crescent fracture first and here i reduce it with traction but as dr sain sir had said i prefer to use many a times a lateral small window open up and put in a plates i can see the si joint properly i can reduce the length of the sac of the ilium which is broken also the mediolateral displacement as well as the antero posterior part when i look at it closely in front of my vision and i put in like a normal si joint fixation two plates which are going at perpendicular acute angle to each other holding the fracture and if you see the only trick out here is that this fracture or the upper plate you have to ensure that it is going into the broken area as well and not only into the fixed or the or the posterior part of ilium which is already intact with the sacrum and then on the iliac crest to ensure the top we have also put in one screw which is holding the broken iliac bone where the ilio lumbar ligament comes and it is holding it with the posterior column and that i in my hands i always feel that if it is type 1 or type 2 days classification where it is more anterior than posterior my ilio sacral screw i am not very sure where exactly they are going because we are not putting in the plates as carlos has said i put in through a single screw so that might be going through the fracture side so this always helps me in supine position getting an accurate reduction and i can see in the image also how my reduction goes both the bony as well as the joint dislocation part and then as regularly we do we have put it in the reduction part with fractions if we could get it we were able to get it problem with easily in a percutaneous fashion with some pins and the joysticks which we use i normally use a picador like an iliosacral like a c clamp positioning where we put in i put in the c pick a door out there and give traction and if it is reducing we put in the guide wires and we have put in the two guide wires and the screws simple screws for the si joint dislocation here regarding the interior fixation once we have done that we can see in all the three views that yes the screws are going not into the neural foramina of both the opposite and the medial or the or the left or the right sides many a times i do not fix the interior portions when there are bilateral or even a pubic rami fracture but this if you see is a very highly unstable pelvis which has got fractured and ligamentous disruptions are there on both the sides both the hemi pelvises so i feel it is imperative to fix the interior here as was told by professor carlos and i just went about holding them with small screws minim and just giving a small incision and reducing that and putting in the screws so this is the fixation which i could get my intention was to add some anterior stability so the smaller screws were put i didn't want to be a perfect going into a long screws because i thought that maybe this amount of fixation is going to help me this was his initial comments or initial things immediate post drops and we were able to get this is his final when it was more or less in a acute in a reduced position and when he had come to us for follow up so my i think that we have tried to fix up all the pelvis on the all the sides my question is regarding the rehab process when we have such cases where both the hemi pelvises are involved how do we make these patients rehab because do we do in bed mobilization and wheel or a wheelchair mobilization or we can go about allowing them to put bear weight bearing within first 3 to 4 weeks comments please at least week 4 to 6 weeks we allow in bed mobilization being bilateral the only thing we are scared is our patients don't listen and start you know unduly bearing weight there are chances that the screw might break so in such case probably i might add s2 also that is number 1 but yes toe touch is only after 6 weeks mm -hmm. we are not very confident of our patients behavior with the way we tell them right okay so 
I think I'll finish it here. Uh, uh, yeah. Just one comment. I am extremely aggressive in terms of surgical indication. Mm -hmm. but very cautious, very conservative in terms of early rehabilitation. I, I, I do not think that you need to win, to win an hour to put the patient to work next day because in several cases, this is just a claim to complications. Uh, yeah. For instance, if your screws have a trajectory that is... You, you use this, your screw as reduction tools because the screw is approximating the hemipelvis, but the trajectory of your screw is not against vertical shear forces. For any reason, I try to avoid early weight bearing. And when I say early weight bearing, I consider also being sitting at 90 degrees because this is weight bearing. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to... I tell my patient if for, for any reason I'm not satisfied with the quality of the bone in terms of the fracture pattern and the instability created by the fracture pattern, you have to be the first four weeks just in bed, 45 degrees, uh, waiting for the soft tissue color formation, like the, scar, the fibrous color formation, and then 90 degrees in a wheelchair until fracture healing. By doing this, my percentage of SI joint screw breakage is almost zero. But I have friends in the United States that send the patient to walk with SI screw uh, and they have a lot of breakage of the SI screw. They were not conceived to be working against vertical shear forces. And, yeah. and then the same happened with the 3.5 screw of, of, on the plate of the crescent fracture. But maybe if, because I'm a coward, I assume that, but I don't like to deal with breakage of implants sure. and secondary displacement. Carlos, yes. can I ask one more question? If there is a sacrum fracture where you have done a fully threaded screw, Visa visa sacroiliac disruption where you are like compression as a, a fit also. So will you make a difference in the rehabilitation in the two? To whom? Between a patient where there is a sacrum fracture and you have put a iliosacral screw, visa vis a sacroiliac dislocation where you have got a uh, fixation with the iliosacral screw. Because in a iliosacral uh, in a sacroiliac dislocation, you are having a compression as a force of stabilization. But for a sacrum fracture, you are not compressing it, you are using a fully threaded screw. So, will you differ in your rehabilitation? Uh, yeah, if I have a sacrum fracture and I'm going to be using a screw, I, I defer to the, the rehabilitation. But the other possibility, I increase the stability by the use of a tension band. Uh, not, if you use a tension band, you don't need to compress. Yes, for, yes. If you have a comminuted fracture, Literature and uh, many surgeons say do not compress, but I, I, I learned from experience that I prefer to compress a sacral fracture, moderate compression, than a reverse. Because if you do not compress at all, sacral fracture is going to be all exactly. the time doing like this, especially if you don't fix it in the front. And so it is a non union machine. So, certain amount of compression, how much? This is, my dear friend, very difficult to explain. It's like telling someone else how to kiss a, a lady. This, this, this is not a, a science, this is not a technique, it's an art. You have to feel, you have the perception of how strong is your screw holding and in doubt for fracture or sacral fracture or dislocation, use a tension band. Mm -hmm. Because tension band is going to be holding both hemipelis Proximally, it's going to be avoiding because something it is very difficult to hear from speakers the deformity and the movement created in rotation in the lateral plane. You know, when you one hemisphere is do like this. So I, I've seen many surgeons using one screw for SI joint or for sacral fracture. I sometimes I did put four screws in one S1 body. 
because if the if the bone is very soft, it's a, it's a female and it's aging person, I try to engage one thread of one screw with the thread of the other in order to create a block. And if performing that, I'm afraid of the quality study, do not hesitate in using a tension band, or if you have the surgical skills or money in your pocket, it's fine a perfect instrumentation. Within, in my country, the Speedium by synthesis at least 10 times more expensive than a 4.5 recomplete. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, shall we proceed to the next speaker? Yes. If there are no more questions. Yes. Pranav Shah. Yes. yes, sir. I think you're the next speaker. Please go ahead. I think uh, Pirkasar has completed all the aspect of uh, Christian fracture, which was earlier we were discussing to to be covered by the talks. And, yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> you told me to present the same case which was there with the lecture, so yes. I converted that into the talk <laughs> yes, yes. into a case so, presentation. Because Christian is many times confusion in the approach and fixation techniques. Uh, Thank you. Yes. Okay, Pranav sir. Okay, thank you. This is a train accident victim. She shifted from a district hospital about 100 kilometers away. This is how she has come in our emergency room. She is a female, 42 years old. Uh, train accident, she fell while alighting the train and she was trapped between the platform and the train. It is about eight hours since injury. In ER, her pulse is 124, BP is slightly low, 88 systolic. She is conscious oriented, but very anxious. And in form of primary treatment, she has received a LS belt, a BK slab on the ankle injury, and IV fluids by a single IV line, some antibiotic and analgesic. So that's what has happened. Now, what primary treatment to do before shifting? This is one thing I would I wanted to highlight. I had made it interactive, but because we are in, uh, I mean, a lot of time is less. So I'll just uh, stick to the important points. So this patient was then primarily resuscitated by us. Uh, her shock was managed with uh, two IV lines, thick bore, 18 gauge, 16 gauge. Blood products and crystalloids were given. After stability, her CT scan was done. Her focused abdominal ultrasound was negative for abdominal injuries. Her X-ray chest and cervical spine X-rays were normal. She was catheterized. There was no blood at perineum and there was no hematuria. Uh, 150 ml urine uh, she passed. And on regular reassessment, we found that she was responding well to the hemodynamic, I mean, the management of hemorrhagic shock. So we gave her a binder and then we took her for CT scan. This is a CT scan. If you can see over here, she's having a bilateral posterior arch injury, as you can very well see in both these views. And this is her uh, 3D CT scan. She's showing a right sacrum LR fracture and left SI joint fracture dislocation, which is a crescent fracture as discussed by Dr. Trika. This is our <coughs> 3D CT scan. I would request one person uh, to comment if anything other than what is shown is to be highlighted. Uh, Dr. Srinivas, uh, may I have you to comment? So this is the diagnosis that uh, we are seeing. Do you want to add anything to this? I think he's uh, not connected. He's not connected. In that case, uh, yeah, anybody, uh, doctor? Uh... I, I think neurological deficit is a very big possibility here on the right side because of the compression of the sacral ala around the foramina. Yes, you're right. Absolutely right. She has right EHL ideal weakness and left, uh, left side we could not assess very well, but yes, left side he was able to move the toes. She had an ankle fracture dislocation, so we could not assess very well. But soft right tissues. side she has ehl ideal weakness, yes. Look, look at the soft tissues as well. Posterior injuries are there, sacral injuries. Both yes. sides, railway platform injury, very likely that she has posterior problems of the skin. Yes. That also next. Yes, so this is the 3D CT now of the sacrum. So it is more of a transforaminal injury now, and you can see so many impacted fragments going into the foramina. And we can also see that it's a dysmorphic sacrum, something that uh, Dr. Carlos was, uh, Dr. Uh, Paul Romans was highlighting when he was talking about transiliac bark. 
so this is a dysmorphic sacrum right sided it is a compression or impaction injury with uh, so many comminuted fragments going into the foramen and you can see now question to both the senior faculties uh, including dr carlos anybody can answer would you want to do an mri in this patient if mri what study you will request do you want to do decompression in this patient and what approach would you use for if you want to do decompression let us start with dr carlos uh MRI is a good idea if the patient is able to go into the gantry. If for any reason, we uh, have metallic uh, uh, things around him and you cannot put the patient in the gantry, you cannot use it. But you, if you have a, a good technician, you can recognize the morphology of the roots and you, you can tell if the roots are damaged or not. For, this is about MRI. Uh, about the compression, if the patient is not recovering spontaneously the sensation with such a comminution, it is not a bad idea to think in decompression. But in my experience, those patients who arrive on acute basis, as soon as you restore the anatomy of the patient, the, the amount of uh, spontaneous recovery is very high. However, if you are sure that the, the sensation and, and, and the paralysis are deteriorating with the time, this is the indication for the decompression. Uh, Would you consider recovery. decompression in acute phase? Like the first surgery that we have to do in this patient is pelvic stabilization. Would you add a decompression with stabilization? Uh, if the patient has a clinical condition that allows me to think in decompression, yes. If the patient is severely damaged and the patient has a bilateral chest tube or have a head injury or abdominal injury, I'm not going to attend the decompression because I'm going to risk the life of the patient. And I'm not going to be sure if my decompression did work or not. Because as I said, many patients recover spontaneously as soon as you restore the anatomy. You decompress the anatomy if you open the, the pelvis and uh, you, dec you decompress the foramen. However, if you are in the field of the decompressors, yeah, you can fix, you, you can bypass the fracture line by a spinopelvic instrumentation. You open the back and remove the pieces of one of the foramen. And the literature is. It's not extremely clear, at least the literature I did read, especially from Tim Poleman, at the end, the recovery is not predictable and the amount of satisfactory result is, is not perfect. So finally, because I've done the decompression and those who were absolutely uh, paralyzed and with no sensation, and what I found is all the roots were destroyed. So the decompression only did create much uh, infection rate. So it depends on where you work. If you are working in a well-established place with all the resources. Yes, if you are in a limited environment, think in, the ref in referring the patient to someone else. If you cannot refer the patient and you don't have experience in the compression, this is the kind of procedure you shall must not perform. So what uh, approach would you use to decompress? Because here you can see all the combination is in the front anteriorly. And most of the times we go prone position and decompress from behind. So do you think we'll be able to adequately decompress the root all the way to the anterior part of the sacral foramina? You can reach L5 very easily. It's not so easy to, to reach S1 from anterior. As soon as you want to go to S2, you are going to be dealing with the artery and the rectum because you are in the small pelvis. So mm -hmm. I don't think it is very easy to, to work at this level unless, unless you perform the judet osteotomy of the pelvis. Judet has described an oste a vertical osteotomy anterior to the SI joint for the surgery of tumor. And then you open the pelvis, you and you open the posterior component of your osteotomy like a window. And this is the only way, as I know, to go very, very deeply in the pelvis without working in a funnel. Because otherwise, if you are performing a 
first window approach, you cannot reach all the fracture lines. The, the only way to reach a fracture line is by the back or performing this kind of osteotomy, which is, it, it's, it's a battery because uh, you have to split the gluteal maximum. You need to, 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 to do the osteotomy of, of the iliacus. And uh, if I'm going to do the compression, probably I will do it by the back, or if I'm going to do a decompression at the front, is I'm going to reach only L5, S1, and not further without any risk. Because you have risk in also the sexual capacity, if you say, main because of the damage of the uh, of, of the nerves uh, of, which are regulated sexual function. So this lady, uh, Carlos, she has only EHL EDL weakness on the right side and some sort of neuralgic pain on right side. But other than that, she doesn't have any significant uh, neurological deficit. Uh, another, I mean, another opinion from somebody uh, like Dr. Sen or Dr. Trikha, if you have had any experience of primary decompression in these kind of cases. Yes, I have done few decompressions. And for me, one thing is important. It is the distraction first, which actually decompresses. So once you distract the compression area, automatically the fragments are likely to leave a space and posteriorly you have done the laminotomy, you have taken up the, you have done the de-roofing, you are able to see the posterior side. I have no experience going anteriorly, I have done from the posterior side only. And once you have distracted it, you tend to get back the space for the fragments to get back to their own position and the nerves are relatively free and there with minimum manipulation you can get. I have done some with the neurosurgeon also, where we could really trace the nerve anteriorly from the backside. I'll restrict to that level only. I will not go more than that. But then in that case, you will go from the posterior side, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And you, you, by meaning, by distraction, you mean that distraction between the two iliac crests. Yes, so that you want exactly. to attain the width of the sacrum. Yes, exactly. Because that will actually bring the sacrum for a minor. Actually, that is a decompression. I will achieve that effect which will be helped by manipulation and by using those uh, nerve roots and all that. So in that case, sir, your first approach would be taking the patient in prone and going for a decompression as well as uh, some sort of a trans iliac, a trans sacral yes. fixation from behind, yes. right? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, fantastic. And in so that, that is case, one I'll be using uh, those screws across the sacrosciatic uh, uh, buttress area, which will help me in distracting also. Yes. So it will be almost a lumbopelvic fixation on yes. one side and another yes. side, distracting the two and trying to get uh, between. Yes. Yes. So in that case, uh, that will even take care of the other sided uh, crescent fracture. Uh, also, you can manage in the prone position. Yes. So that is one very good way of approaching this, uh, doing it in prone position. Now, I had, uh, I mean, we have all the backup in our hospital. We have neurosurgeons and everybody, but they were of the opinion that this patient uh, as uh, Carlos has very rightly highlighted, it's going to be very difficult to decompress the front part. And uh, they said that it's better to just uh, manage the instability, stabilize the pelvis. Let us watch the patient after a few weeks. And if it is required, then we will consider decompression later on. So this was that patient's condition. As uh, Dr. Trika had highlighted, the patients have a lot of soft tissue injuries when they are entrapped between the train and the platform. This is a right-sided wound where you can see all the fat necrosis is just coming out as soon as you press over there. So she had bad soft tissues and she was obese patient with uh, this kind of uh, condition. So I have now in this situation, uh, how would you like to stabilize? How would you like to reduce whether we will open or not? And is fixator as a primary treatment enough or not? So. Yes, no, yes, no. Uh, let me ask one by one. Let's ask first uh, Dr. Uh, Srinivas. Dr. Srinivas, how would you like to stabilize this patient? Uh, Oscar, I mean, bony wise. Are you here? He's not here. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, Dr. Kishore, how would you like to stabilize this patient? Mm, uh, I will put a external fixator, uh, sorry, I will first uh, prone this and distract as uh, mentioned by Dr. Sen. Then uh, uh, in the prone position, I'll put a fixator looking at this condition and... Uh, uh, prone position fixator means you are talking about... Uh, no, no, no. Uh, first okay, I'll, you stabilize in the prone from post for posterior elements and then you make it supine and then put to fixator. That is what you are saying. 
Yes, yes. Okay, okay, fine. Uh, Dr. Vivek Trikha, uh, would you prefer to do this patient in prone position? No, first of all, for me, I'll do minimal fixation, which is possible from the anterior side and try to take care of the morale level. This is going to create yes. havoc. This is going to really create havoc. It is railway platform injury. You wait for seven days and then see the skin condition. I can guarantee you the entire skin on the back is going to cause problems and you will have got nothing. The only issue or only thing is you may put in a screw, iliosacral screw, just as a temporizing measure to stabilize the pelvis on the back side. And then the crescent and other things you can put in from a supraacetabular fixator. I'll remain there and concentrate all my fixations and all my energy on the soft tissue after that. Yes. Yes. Very, very nice. Important point highlighted by uh, Dr. Trikha. So it is a soft tissue many times which dictates how we go ahead. So I think all of us will agree that there is no point going for open reduction and going for extensive approaches in this patient because this skin condition can go bad to worse. So this is what I have done. Put skeletal tractions on both sides, put the patient on traction per operatively. This is the left side, the uh, reduction, the traction has helped to get uh, axial alignment, but still there is a little gap at the SI joint, which has been managed with uh, sort of an ST pin and that gap is corrected. Uh, multiple wires were passed with that uh, well-reduced position and then screws were passed. Uh, as uh, Dr. Trika has said that many times we are not very sure whether these screws are going through the fracture or not. So even an LC2 screw was passed to stabilize this uh, crescent so that uh, that crescent is now one piece and then these screws can have a better hold. So this is the treatment done on left side and uh, then the patient was put on a fixator so that I could get some amount of distraction which Dr. Sain had highlighted so that I can get a little bit of reduction of that uh, right-sided sacrum fracture. Since the patient has uh, uh, sacral dysmorphism, I will not be able to get many screws on the S1. I may get one or two screws. So I have done all my left-sided fixation in S2 segment and left the S1 segment for the right-sided. This is what I have achieved after uh, distracting and putting two fully threaded screws on right side. Now, what for the anterior arch? We already have the fixator, so we have retained the fixator for some time. As uh, Dr. Trika said, we wash for the soft tissues. We have put uh, uh, this uh, drainage and we are uh, doing the dressing. Fortunately, that soft tissues over a period of time healed, settled down. This is the post-operative x-ray of that patient. Two screws on left, two screws on right, and external fixator plus one LC2 screw. Though it is not a perfect anatomic reduction, but I think it is good enough to stabilize the patient. Any comments on this, uh, Dr. Kale? Sorry, I didn't get your question. Yeah, any comments on this final fixation? Would you want to improve in any way or you are happy with whatever is achieved? No, it looks quite good with her, uh, I mean, Reasonable suspected and acceptable. moral level type of lesion. Yeah. But I think you would have had to do a, at least one or two deployments of that moral level lesion. Yeah, we have done two times, uh, just wash out and it has fortunately settled down. It has not uh, got infected. It was not a huge moral level lesion. It was more of a fat necrosis. But still, over a period of time, it has settled down. So that has not bothered us. This patient was discharged on the, I think, on 11th or 12th post-operative day. Uh, she was sent home with uh, stable you know, hemodynamic condition and continuing dressing at home. She came back to me at four and a half months after uh, being discharged. She, sh she shifted to Hyderabad. My friend, Dr. Srinivas Kasa took care of her over there. Uh, her healing was relatively uneventful. She started walking by two months. She started full weight bearing walking by three months. She came back to me at four and a half months with uh, this condition. She's uh, otherwise okay, but only the EHL EDL has not completely improved and she, has st she still has pain and paresthesia on the right side. So now again, the question that arise in my mind and I'm sharing with you, whether we are justified to go for any sort of neurological intervention at this point of time. Uh, just a, one comment from Dr. Sin. My perception is that if that damage has already been there for four and a five, four months or five months, probably, I don't know, because it was a compression injury and that the uh, fragments might still be there, but the injury which is caused right now might and might not be. So uh, uh, there are two uh, uh, problems with when we have got the pelvic uh, injury along with the neurological damage. There are some traction injuries, just like a vertical mm -hmm. shearing. 
where actually you cannot do anything because there are attraction injuries and you can't get it. But in a compression injuries, there is a definitive element of a bony compression in the foramina. And if that is done, the easiest is at the time when it is acutely done and probably we can have a better outcome. But if it is late by five months, I did have a case where after two months, probably we did it and it uh, recovered. But uh, four or five months, probably staying in that kind of a compression, uh, I doubt about whether it will be successful. But depending upon the disability of the patient, I think there is no harm in doing it. Sir, literature says that primary nerve injuries that you have in sacral fractures, they usually, you have to warn the patient that they may not get back the yes. power. Yes. yes. Yeah, my because only concern is, in this... Uh, it is sir, a big only compression over cases. the nerves, which is important. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, you're right, sir. I, I absolutely agree with you. But my only concern in this case was that so much of all the compression or the elements were all anterior. So how we would, even our neurosurgeons were like, uh, how will we reach over there from behind? It's very difficult. We can decompress from behind, but what can we do in the front? So even Dr. Carlos has said that reaching S2 level, S2 foramina would have been almost impossible. Reaching S1 could have been managed somehow. So I think uh, initially and, uh, you know, considering the patient's overall hemodynamic condition, we were thinking of minimal invasive surgeries and try to minimize the complications. So... This patient at four and a half months with EHL EDL improving only pain and paresthesia. Again, I suggested that you can undergo a surgery for this, but we are not sure whether it's going to help you or not. She opted out of it. And at two years, she came again. Uh, that time I got a chance to do her MRI scan because I wanted to still see whether the neurological aspect uh, is, you know, is something that we can manage. So this was her uh, MRI, which shows that almost the cord and everything looks all okay. This is the certain cuts they have taken for the L5 route, but even the new radiologist was inconclusive about the MRI, especially because of the implants and implant artifacts. We did a EMG NCV which showed partial denervation of L5-S1, but they could not localize whether it was at the level of root or whether it was at the level of trunk. So unfortunately, even at the end of all these investigations, uh, we were not sure whether we can do anything for this patient. Anything else that we could have uh, investigated or any other idea of investigating such a patient with neurological injury? I think uh, I think yeah. impressive about these injuries because we do not have a very good evidence of having successfully done all these injuries. So, so th that is my, my perspective is if it is possible, the skin condition permits, everything permits, probably the primary decompression is the best. Yeah, thing. I think within first three weeks is the best thing to do, right? Yes. Okay. So this is uh, our I have, yes, I have a, a small piece of advice is that the um, first you, you, you can, at that moment, you can remove the implants and then you can obtain a much better uh, MRI. Yes. But then you can do a, a, an injection. Uh, Similar that the injection you perform when the patient has a lumbar disc herniation. You can do the injection of a corticoid and anesthetic, uh, anesthetic into the root in order to distinguish in between the inflammation and entrapment of the root due to the scar tissue. Uh, what, it, it, what I do is I go, I put the patient prone, then I try to localize S1 foramina, foramen, and then I put my needle in S1 from the back to the front. I check it with the CR. Usually radiologists who are able to perform the injection for the, this herniation, they do not attempt to do this. And then I, I do my injection in, in the foramen. And the second injection, I. Uh, go with my needle on top of the sacrum with the trajectory of the sacral slope and try to finish where I imagine is L5 and I do an injection in this point. Several times, I cannot say it's a recovery, but it's an improvement of the symptoms of the patient. And uh, some surgeons, they do 
release of the root on late uh, basis. I have done the release of L5 in the front and then it is not very easy because I, I need to remove not only scar tissue, but also bone formation, especially in the sacral fracture, if there is a gap or a step, when you try to remove you and the step is displaced, you can find that the root is stretched and then you can create a notch while you are releasing the, the root. And by doing that, you think you have done a good job and the results are not at random. So I'm not so sure if it, it, it is a little bit late for that kind of release. I've, I've done it twice. That means in, a, in a statistical terms, nothing. And the patient after that is, well, it's a little bit better, but I'm not so sure if this is a placebo effect of, of being operated by your surgeon. And if you have a good relationship, they say they don't want to make you feel unhappy and they say they did improve. But this is one possibility because many times the root is not entrapped into the sacrum, which is what you think could be very helpful by the decompression. It is entrapped in the front due to yes. the scar tissue and, and the bone formation. Because I, I've done the surgery with a neurosurgeon or a spinal surgeon, they release everything in the back, but what they, they see in the back is very little because mostly L5 is entrapped in the front while it has already exit the, the, the top of the sacrum. In fact, there is a, surg uh, is a clinical uh, description of um, sub something like the canal carpal tunnel syndrome, that is the entrapment of L5 in the dorsal aspect of the sacrum due to uh, uh, variants, anatomical variants of the ligaments. So if you do this and you release everything, maybe it can improve, but I recommend to do it carefully because you can damage the already small recovery of the radicular activity. Yeah, I think, but the injection is a very good idea. We can try that and we can at least assure that it's not in the sacral foramina. Yeah, so coming back to our story, this is her x-ray at two years, which shows that almost all the fractures have healed. And this is her function at two years. So she's able to sit uh, the way she wants. She's able to uh, do single leg stance both sides. This is her walking, her gait. There is a slight limp. Other than that, she doesn't have much of a problem. And uh, as I said, it's very difficult to convince a patient when we are ourselves not convinced about the outcome of surgery. So I was not actually able to convince her whether uh, we should go for a decompression or not. So she has just pushed it to a later date. My now last two questions is uh, whether implant removal should be uh, done. And I think Carlos has answered it. Yes, implant removal can be done to have a better imaging in form of MRI scan. And nowadays, uh, these MRI scans are coming with new software, which highlights the nerves. So I think when we get that, it's going to be uh, more exciting. Uh, anybody aware of it or anybody already using it? Yeah, we, we have a, a, a software. We have to ask for a special uh, technique that you can trace the roots. So that's the reason I said hardware removal. There is another reason. Sometimes what I have done when the, the screw is very near the position of the root, I profit of cannulated the screw and I release uh, corticosteroids through the hole of the of the screw. After removal of the screw, you can use it, and then you can put your injection very near where the root is. This is an also another trick. And in your case, she is doing so well. Uh, so we what we use sometimes is some chemicals to in order to diminish. Uh, I don't know the name in English, but in Spanish the name is. Uh, pregabalina uh -huh. uh, he used it yeah yeah we, they know are, we have been giving it to her she has been using it judiciously as and when required and and and, and it, it, it is improving a lot the symptomatology of the patient and finally th this is something you, you can say everywhere 
try to find an interesting activity for your patient. Uh, because we know, and I am telling you this from my own experience as a patient, you, you have to train your patient to develop uh, affective indifference to the pain. That means try to move the pain from the cortex of your brain into a subcortical level. The pain is going to continue in place, but as soon as you focus your attention in something different, you, ca you can live with the pain in a way which is less creating less anxiety to you. And finally, there is some psychiatric medication, antidepressive medication that helps a lot to manage this situation. Okay. Yes, so that's the end of it. Thank you everybody for your patient listening. Yes, so, uh, so there is one case which is uh, related to all these nerve injury and delayed cases. So should we move uh, to that case or we'll close it because it is uh, uh, my presentation. I think so, it's quite late now. Okay. So uh, we'll close the session. Kale, sir. So we must thank Carlos for his time and the kind of a... Pranav, sir, just one thing. What is the status of the sural nerves in that case? Sural is fine. Okay. Patient so, has an ankle injury on the other side. So can I just shortly present my case because it is more, it is more related to that scenario. With five minutes only. Okay. Sure. Uh, so this is a... Uh, so is it visible, sir? Mm -hmm. Quite okay. Okay. So this is a young male presented after three weeks uh, uh, with this injury. So uh, I will not waste much time with this classification because there is already, uh, this is the axial cord. So you can see this uh, uh, left side uh, uh, SI joint has been disrupted. So it is a mixed type of FPC and both uh, LC injury. Uh, even the L5 transverse process is uh, broken. So uh, I will place it in between uh, LC3 and uh, vertical shear injury as we have discussed earlier. So, um, uh, yes, this is actually, this was actually the topic which uh, was earlier uh, planning to, to be uh, taken by Pranav Sa, Dr. Pranav Sa. And this is the zone where actually the EO classification, tile, tile classification and your young burgess classification. Uh, there is a gray zone between the defining stable fracture and unstable fracture. So this is how I fixed. I uh, uh, released the soft tissue from the SI joint then um, fixed in this way. And the next post-op day, I found uh, this uh, no dorsiflexion of the toe, anchor dorsiflexion was minimal and sensation was intact. The only thing that uh, I was, uh, I have not examined the patient preoperatively adequately. So I so I can't uh, uh, comment whether it is due to the surgery itself or it was uh, associated uh, uh, before. Uh, because if you can see uh, the uh, proximal plate or the distal plate, uh, it is too medial. The two screws are on the sacrum. So I have retracted more. And this happened due to uh, uh, the exchange of Farabo clamp. When I compressed this plate actually go, uh, went medial uh, more medial. Uh, so, okay. Okay. You can see uh, this, this SI joint has been reduced. Uh, uh, yes. This is the three month follow-up. This one thing I want to highlight that with three month follow-up, he has the gluteal lurch. Uh, you can say the abductor weakness. He can uh, do a uh, single leg stance on the uh, healthy side, but not unable uh, not unable to do on the uh, fracture side. So then I did a MRI and the, the MRI said that the, there was edema in the root region. So uh, uh, <clears throat> then I went through the literature and there are 65 cases uh, uh, have been reported till date and uh, most of the recoveries are within one year. After one year, there is no recovery. So they have done a, a EMG study and uh, uh, this NCB studies and they have found that the uh, sural nerve is an important indicator for the uh, prognosis. If the sural nerve is in involved, then the uh, uh, 
injury is most likely the post plexus and if the sural nerve is not involved it is most likely the pre plexus and it is a good indicator of the uh, uh, prognosis so you can see the sural nerve most of the sural nerve injury there are on assisted gait they have uh, developed the on assisted gait uh, so so in conclusion they tell that lumbar sacral plexopathy after pelvic trauma is a characteristic lesion it is commonly associated with the lumbar plexar injury that rarely occur in isolation and sciatic neuropathy is seen in acetabular fracture but not in sacroiliac disruption or pelvic fracture and gait outcome is predicted by electrodiagnostic data gait outcome is worse in patient with sciatic neuropathy than the lumbar sacral plexus injury so this is after the 6 month he sent me the video then okay so this is the video that he sent today only so it has recovered completely uh, so you can you cannot notice any limp uh, like that which was uh, present earlier so it was a traction injury as rightly said by professor sen uh, it recovers well so that's from here sir yes so in short i just uh, so any comment sir uh, that was expectable as a good result because you the patient didn't have a complete paralysis from the very beginning yes so when the you have a partial paralysis of yes. the same innervation region that means you can dorsiflex partially the ankle but not the the, the the toe you can expect a recovery and usually if the patient has good sensation and partial motor recovery you can expect with the time a much better motor situation yes. so for me the, the only nightmare is a complete paralysis of both branches of the sciatic nerve Yes, because uh, in if the plantar sensation and motor activity is complete and you have a paralysis of the dorsiflexion, I go to sleep and, and I, I it wasn't created by myself. I go to sleep without any trouble because I know that there is cross innervation first and second. If you had a, a, a good muscle on the on the plantar part of your foot you can do a transfer later on and recover a, a good dorsiflexion by the tibialis posterior into tibialis anterior transplantation okay. i mean is so you have this oppor second opportunity yes and we 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 have done several times this kind of rescue and those patient who after one year did haven't recover a uh, good dorsiflexion and they have good plantar flexion we transfer the tibialis posterior into the tibialis anterior position it works wonderfully yes so so we will uh, conclude sir now so on behalf of odisha orthopedic association i uh, heartily uh, thankful to our overseas faculty professor romans professor carlos and along with our indian faculty professor sen professor uh, dhawal desai and uh, uh, sinivas kasa sir dr pranav sir and dr kale sir so i will thankful to our ortho team uh, coordinator dr asok sir and samsul hoda uh, dr samsul hoda and uh, not the least uh, i am very much thankful to my association odisha orthopedic association for which uh, i'm able to do this event so thank you thank you oh, we'll see you again in future sir have a good day yes right so any, so any final message to conclude from uh, sen sir sir yeah no this has been wonderful and, and i appreciate kishore to to have taken such an active stand and really is doing something good and especially inviting professor omans and carlos especially i'm very happy because uh, we are able to see something which you don't see otherwise 
Yes. And that is the biggest thing because uh, routine things we are always talking about. But when we have a problem which is similar to our country and which is probably many times in our country, especially the pelvic mal union, non unions, and we have a lot of so there is a lot of relief. So both the topics, both by Professor Romans also is something which is coming up. We don't know, and both this problem which is rampant, but we don't know how to do it. So I think they were wonderful speakers, and with their wonderful experience, we have been able to get a lot and. The credit definitely goes to Kishore for arranging everything. I think because uh, once we are now we are not able to uh, to do these type of cases. Once we see that after down the line four five year or like so that we can start at least. Yes, surely sir. I hope that goes well. So Dinesh Kaliji, Doctor Carlos, Doctor Carlos, once again it was amazing, amazing, amazing. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it was a real, yeah. it was a real pleasure for me share this morning for me this afternoon for you with all of you, and uh, so excuse me if I was chatting too much because in between friends this is what I try to do explain what I think. And Sir, if I you would have gone the whole you. length for three hours still, we would have just kept watching. It was absolutely <laughs> amazing. Actually, we caught all the four lectures to listening only. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay. Okay then. Thank you. Okay then. All, All of you. Bye, good night. Okay. Good night. Bye bye. Good night, Carlos. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye -bye. you for everything. Thank you. Sleep well. Yes. Sir. Thank you. Good day to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> see you sometime. Yeah. See you. See you. Yeah. Okay. Stay. Stay healthy. Yeah. Let's go. Take care. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, sir. Bye, sir. Bye. Bye, sir. So see you on Monday, sir.